technical issues there, but hopefully you can all hear me loud and clear now. You're all very welcome to the Fermanagh Noma District Council Policy and Resources Committee meeting held this evening, Wednesday, the 15th of June, 2022. I'm chairing the meeting from the Town Hall in Enniskillen, and I'm joined by five councillors in the chamber and others via WebEx. First of all, a few prelims. I just, first of all, like to thank my party colleagues for entrusting me with the chair of this very important committee for the time ahead. And I want to pay tribute to the past chair who was in the chair last year, that councillor Howard Thornton. Very well done, done there, Howard. I'm looking forward to working with Chief Executive Alison McCullough, the Director of Corporate Service and Governance, Salim McCartney, MBE, and the team. Also looking forward to working with all councillors in a positive and constructive manner to get the business of the meetings completed. Just with regard to the system, uh, I will not be muting. I'll not be keeping people on mute. Uh, you'll be glad to hear that one. But please bear in mind, respect the chair and each other, and there'll be no need to enforce that issue. First of all, I will be going to the chamber and then uh, via WebEx. With regard to this evening's agenda, there are 10 items, some with various reports and some for decision and others for noting. And I have one item of any urgent and relevant business. Uh, it's from Councillor McAdoff, and that'll be at the appropriate time. Just to remind members, uh, the deadline for items for any urgent and relevant business is no later than 6 p.m. on the day of the meeting. So if we're traveling and, and what have you, that we have time to uh, sort those matters out. So Councillor McAdoff was in before the sixth deadline. So thank you for that. Okay, on with the agenda. And first of all, uh, apologies. And first of all, I go to the Sinn Féin group leader and that's Councillor Tommy Maguire. Thank you. So what's down here? I go to the Kaherley, August Kogarjis Lat, August Sao Mord and Vlian Chogin, in Yuri and Thailand. So uh, good luck, Erlen, your chair in for the next year. Uh, just two apologies from the grouping, uh, Councillor Anthony Feely, Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, uh, Councillor Stephen McCann's late but hopes to join us, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. And next we go over now to the Ulster Unionist Party Group Leader and it's Councillor Robert Irvine. Yes, um, look forward to a good year, um, Chair. Uh, no apologies from us as a group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Irvine. Now over to the Democratic Unionist Party, and it's via WebEx and Councillor Paul Robinson. All the best for the year ahead, Chair. Uh, apology from Paul, Councillor Paul Stevenson. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Robinson. Over now to the Social Democratic and Liberal Party, SDLP, Councillor Mary Gardy via WebEx. Thanks very much, Chair. And again, like everyone else, best of luck in your year, Errol. Um, one apology from ourselves tonight, Councillor Gannon. Thank you. Thanks again, Councillor Gerdy. And now down to smaller parties uh, and dependents. Any apologies? Okay, I'm not aware of any. I'm not seeing any on any screen here. So that's okay. And on to item two, uh, just the same minutes and confidential minutes of the previous meeting held on the 11th of May 2022. And that has already been done. On to item three, and that's declarations of interest, if any. Councillor Alex Baird, via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. As with others, best wishes for the incoming year. Uh, declaration of interest in relation to paper A211, the NILGA payment as uh, an executive member of NILGA. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baird. Next up, we have Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly, via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Uh, paper 6.8, item 2.1 of an association with Drunk and Healthy Living Partnership. Okay, thanks, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, on to the next councillor, and uh, it's Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE, via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Um, paper 5, uh, 2.2. .2. Some association 
Chair, thank you. Thank you. And I'll also declare an interest in the Psalm Association at this juncture. Uh, again, back to WebEx, and we have Councillor Catherine Kelly. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair, and good luck in the year uh, ahead. I'm also on the Nilga Executive and declaring an interest there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. You lower your hand, that'll be good. Thank you. Right. There's no 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 other indications. Oh, Councillor McGuire, back to the chamber now for Councillor McGuire. I got my last uh, chair. I, I, my information was wrong on the apologies. Councillor Antifili is online until eight thirty. I apologise for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that deals with that one. So we're now on to matters arising, and uh, and it's matters arising from the, the the two papers and I'll, I'll bring Celine maybe in and we'll, we'll cover the mass, matters raising away and that's for the meeting of Wednesday the 11th of May 2022 and I'll cover page by page page one page two page three page four page five Page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, and page eleven. So the no matters are rising there. Okay, that's that one. Now, moving on to the reports for decision. And item five is the Chief Executive Director reports. And we hand over to Alison McCullough. And it's item 5.1. And asked to consider a miscellaneous report of the Chief Executive. And it's paper A. Thank you, Chair. Executive. Four, thanks, Chair. Four items uh, within the report. The first two relate to subscriptions. Uh, the first is the payment of the Nilga subscription, which amounts to just over £46,800 plus VAT. Uh, the second relates to our payment for the Psalm Association subscription, uh, and that's in the sum of £1,200. I should note, Chair, in relation just to the Psalm Association, uh, we had an expectation that there would be details of a pilgrimage for the Psalm this year, but it is not being arranged centrally via the Psalm, and we have no information relating to that to present to you. Um, the next item relates to the Council and Committee meeting arrangements. And we've just provided an update with the guidance which changed in relation to the working from home arrangements on the 6th of June. Um, and you will have seen from the report, Chair, that their guidance still remains in workplaces, uh, noting the risk of transmission is higher at one metre than compared to two metres. And it is likely that the Department of Health will remain uh, at its own view regarding a two metre social distancing. Um, we've detailed in the report the increased capacity should the council choose to move now to meetings at one metre social distancing and uh, that's for your consideration and then the final item slightly unusual item chair is a uh, correspondence has been received from a resident who's been invited to join the ancient and honourable guild of town criers the application process is more reflective of the arrangements for local authorities in england who appoint town criers which is not something that's done in Northern Ireland. So we're therefore suggesting that we engage directly with the Guild to see if some other uh, notification is appropriate in terms of the membership arrangements. And then there are four recommendations, Chair. Uh, the first two relate to the payments of the subscriptions. The third recommendation, we're asking members to note the updating of the public health guidance relating to COVID-19 and seeking your confirmation as to how you wish to proceed in relation to our future council and committee arrangements. And we request that you note the resident's request for the council to endorse the application to the Ancient and Honourable Guild, uh, but that we liaise directly with the Guild to ascertain whether any alternative endorsement might be appropriate. Thank you, uh, Chief Executive. My intention is to break down the, the recommendations and take the recommendations one, two and four together and dealing with item three separately. So I have an indication in the chamber, and that's from uh, Mr. Robert Irvine. 
Yes, Chair, thank you very much indeed. I'm happy to propose recommendations 8.1, 8.2 and 8.4 as listed in the report. With regard to 8.3, <coughs> Sorry, sorry. If we can deal, if we can get those out of the way. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Point. I'll come back on eight three. Thank okay, you, chair. Okay, that's proposed. I'll be a seconder. The seconder, Councillor Keith Elliott. Are we all agreed with the? I know there's several speakers on Webex, but are we agreed with uh, regarding the those three items? There are four councillors sitting waiting. To speak, I'll, I'll just let the man at this juncture. Uh, Councillor Victor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, just basically going back to the the uh, the SOM Association. Um, uh, that was something, obviously, which some of our members was very uh, was very keen on uh, th through my time in the council. And because the if the SOM is not organising. Uh, as Alison put it, a, a pilgrimage this year. Can pilgrimage? Uh, can uh, is there any facility where we can support members uh, wishing to still attend uh, from the from the council? And, and, and saying that, I'm talking about uh, the 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 committee, the decade of commemorations uh, committee. Uh, and was there not money set aside there? In the in the uh, budget uh, for for the likes of this uh, going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Commissioner Warrington. I'll bring the chief executive on here. Um, Chair, it wouldn't be the norm. I would have to say we would normally uh, receive a proposal um, as to what the costs would be, what the travel arrangements and associated details would be, and that would then be brought to the uh, to the council for approval in the normal way. Uh, we wouldn't generally have an arrangement whereby members would make their own travel arrangements and subsequently be reimbursed for that. Uh, should members wish us to consider such a request, I would suggest at the very least we would need the cost estimate, so that could be before members. Okay. Okay. The, the only problem there will be that, uh, it is my understanding that uh, that is the sum uh, takes place at the end of this month, so and the start of July, so uh, we'll we'll see how we go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warrington. Uh, I'm going to take the councillors via WebEx on this occasion because they've had their hands up. Uh, if you can lower your hand there, Councillor Warrington. Uh, next up is Councillor Seamus Green via WebEx. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, my broadband again if that uh, dropped there so uh, just to clarify is the is the maintenance uh on uh, being discussed on this uh we're, we're good just before you go any further council green and um, sorry you were dropped out there but uh we're going to take that and we've we have dealt with uh three of these issues all right we're well i wanted that, to we're going to take that separately okay so, i wanted to at that stage uh, just just on the on the other three then uh, 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 just to make a comment on the town criers um again uh chair this uh again is uh, completely discriminatory against uh, rural uh dwellers there doesn't seem to be any rural criers allowed in this here it seems to be only uh, town criers so uh, i'd like to uh, express my disappointment in that because there's a lot of rural criers as well, including myself. <laughs> Your comments are noted there, Councillor Green. <laughs> now, next up, we have uh, Councillor Alex Baird via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my comments are in relating to item three, so I will uh, bow to abeyance there on that. For that, you're, you're bringing that up later. Yeah, well, well, we're going to bring it in. We're trying to get three of these issues sorted out first, and then we'll. Right, fair we'll enough. Then I'll come back on that if you allow me. And uh, I would concur with Councillor Green there. I think we have a preponderance of rural criers. They may not be formalised, but they're there. Maybe I'm one myself. Thank you, Chair. Okay, do I thank leave you. My hand up? Do I leave my hand up in relation to items? I'll, I'll just, just, just leave it there. We'll let you, we'll, I, we'll let you come in on that one. Thanks, uh, Councillor Paul Robinson via WebEx. No, 2.3 is coming on in there. Right, we'll just let sit, just sit there and we'll, we'll deal with that separately. Councillor Bree Swift. 
Yeah, Gor Maggot Kirlock. And I know uh, some of the comments there about uh, point number four on the town crier has been a little bit tongue in cheek. I don't agree with it really anyway, the entire concept. But I would like to yeah. seek some clarification from Alison on the last part of the sentence on that, where uh, the council officers are going to ascertain whether any alternative endorsement or letter of support might be appropriate. But the situation is, if it's not appropriate, what then? I actually don't agree with the endorsement of it um, whatsoever. So uh, even that, I wouldn't even be satisfied with. Um, so if I can just have a little bit of clarification on that, uh, Gurmagat Kirlik. Thank you, Councillor Swap. Uh, Chief Executive. Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, Councillor, the intention would be that we would explore, I suppose we'd clarify the situation firstly with the Guild, because the application form currently requires the formal endorsement of the council seal, which would su suggest a contract between the council and the town crier, which is not something that we would be undertaking. Uh, so it's really to clarify whether, uh, for example, if members were minded, letter of support would meet the guild's requirements, we would then report back to you next month by way of matters arising as to the update on those discussions. So it wouldn't be something that we would execute on the basis of this uh, committee's consideration. We'll be coming back to you with an update. Okay. Thanks very much, Alison. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to go on and we're going to th those three items be proposed and seconded. I think we're all in agreement with them. Not seeing any indications to the contrary. Uh, your comments have been noted, Councillor Swift, and there'll be further uh, comments from the Chief Executive due course. Uh, now I'm going to go to section three of uh, of that particular item, and that's the uh, notes the updating of the public health guidance in relation to COVID-19 confirms how it wishes to proceed in relation to future council and committee arrangements. So. Over now to Councillor Robert Irvine in the Chamber. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, we've had a discussion within our party group. Um, there are a couple of views coming forward, but the collective view would be, uh, would it be possible to get an indication, and I know it can't be tied down, in regard to the costs pertaining to our current model additionality, I know we have additional IT staff, but we're saving on travel time. If we went down to the one metre distance, which is the next option down, what would be the cost? Is there any reduction in IT? And uh, there would be an increase in a possible travel costs, you know, for members. And the last scenario, I suppose, is if we went out of full hybrid, um, what would be the uh, implications from a staff point of view and a travel time? I think it's just that we need to have a look at that just to see what's going on to give us maybe a better indication in regard to what route to travel down. So that would be my proposal and it would be attached basically to defer decision on this until we get those costs coming back. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, thanks for that, Councillor Irvine. We have Three other councillors, I think, want to speak on this one. So, and, and they're via WebEx, and that's Councillor Alex Baird. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll take the opportunity to second my colleague Robert Irvine's comments or a proposal there. Um, I, I would like to say I attended a meeting of Nil or sorry, Ikban today in Sligo uh, Council Chamber. And as an aside, I've never heard a better acoustic system in any council chamber that I have. Uh, had the pleasure of visiting as a councillor. And uh, I would suggest that it may be worthwhile somebody from RIT liaising with Sligo Council. I've got a name of their head of IT with a view to um, looking at the system they have because the acoustics were perfect. Now, the meeting we had today was a hybrid meeting, but there was over 20 councillors at it and um, four officers or three officers rather from uh, ECBAN. Uh, there was no social distancing and there were no screens and that seems to be the norm uh, in the in the councils uh, in the republic um, i spoke to colleagues from cavan and monaghan and they were in a similar vein as i say we, we were sitting beside each other there was no social distancing no screens 
Um, and uh, I think there were four councillors on the Webex. Uh, now, I, I'll be honest, I'm of the opinion that we should, uh, when it's appropriate to get back and finance, finance, as Robert says, is one of the matters on this. But I, I'm convinced that relationship between councillors uh, is currently not as good as it was when we're having live meetings, where not only the business was done at the meeting, but before and after the meeting, there was a bit of crack, for want of a better way of putting it, which led to a better rapport and understanding, and indeed the building of a team ethos, team for Mana and Oma. So um, I would just like to put that into the, uh, the consideration of things. It seems rather strange um, that on this side of the border, we are uh, Northern Ireland, uh, we're um, we're looking at distance, and we we'll have to take we have to take advice, obviously, from the appropriate authority. But um, I, I, I personally think the time's coming when we need to get back, and, and I think we eventually need to get back to fully live council and committee meetings. I think Webex, Zoom, etc., uh, is appropriate for the if I refer to them as the lesser meetings. Um, uh, it's the we can get the best of both worlds in that. So I'll leave it in that because. Uh, if we can get the figures back, uh, it'll be a contributing factor to make a decision. But I thought those uh, rep uh, reporting those facts was relevant. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Baird. So proposed secondly. We now will bring in Councillor Paul Robinson via WebEx. Yeah. Uh, um, when people start mixing and going into the shops all together, no masks, no nothing. Over the last lot of weeks there, a lot of people have met up everywhere. And uh, I think we should be going back to one meter social distance in the chamber. And I'll make that a proposal. The sooner we get back to the chamber, the better. I think the business needs to be done in the chamber. Okay, you're making a proposal that with this is with uh, from uh, with effect from July, basically. You're saying is that right? Well, we could leave it to September to the start of the leave to September start off in September. You have July, just the July meeting, and you have off in August, and then you have the officers time to get everything sorted out for September. Okay. Thank you. We'll now to Councillor Seamus Green via WebEx. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was uh, going to agree there with Paul until his last uh, sentence about leaving it to September. Uh, I think we should be getting back in. The summertime is the time we should be. Uh, getting started on this, not as we can back into the autumn again. Uh, just a few comments on it. Um, we have staff now back fully uh, in the bin lorries, for instance, three people uh, sitting in the front of uh, bin lorries. We, we uh, expect them to do that. There's no problem with them doing that. Uh, uh, when you're out and about, uh, the pubs are back to normal, the restaurants are back to normal, the shops are basically back to normal. And uh, we are seeing, we seem to be in some sort of a bubble. I don't know what advice the Department of Health is given about one, one meter. I don't see how that could even make any sense. That is even, even a thing that if you're one meter from somebody, like uh, you're basically beside them. So uh, to me, the uh, democracy uh, is crucial here that we are sitting in the same chamber making the decisions, not isolated in in our houses, uh, talking to other uh, this way. It's not natural. Uh, to me, um, Alex made a good uh, point there about Slego and uh, about uh, building relationships and everything. I think we should be back. I'm baffled as to this advice because nobody out there has, has taken it. Our council staff is expected to get into the lorries together and everything, and uh, we are still talking about uh, um, having a metre apart. It makes no sense whatsoever. So the quicker we get back fully into meetings, the better, in my opinion. Councillor Green, uh, just wondering, uh, are you, can I clarify the situation that you're actually proposing that everyone's back in the chamber as from July 2022? Uh, well, I, 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 that's my personal opinion, what we should be doing. But 
I'm not going to go against it uh, if there is a dice. That it's, uh, if that is the uh, the is, it, just to clarify, is this one meter advice or uh, is it recommended or is it actually uh, the rule? Because I I'm, I don't see it being uh, being anywhere else. Yeah, I, I'm going to bring the chief executive and to clarify the situation. Thank you. Yeah, no, just to confirm, Chair, it, it's specifically guidance, so it's advisory in nature. Uh, it's not mandatory and it's not regulated. And in the context of the other workplace environments that were referenced, what the onus on the employer is to do a risk assessment on each venue. So that would include, for example, the cabs for lorries or any other facilities as well. And you do you take it, you'll have seen from the report, uh, it says where practicable. So it is not, or sorry, where possible. Um, it's not always possible to maintain distance of one metre and it is widely acknowledged that that is not being uh, generally adhered to in society at large. Uh, from our own council perspective, we risk assess all of our activities and we do continue to have mitigations in place, but there is no mandatory uh, element associated with this. And I suppose just to be clear, Chair, the, the one metre is coming from the executive COVID-19 task force. The Department of Health is remaining at two metres. Okay, does that clarify the situation for you, Councillor Green? Yeah, yeah, it's even more baffling. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, it clarifies it. I know the council is in a, uh, an awkward position, uh, uh, but it has only guidelines. But I'm happy enough with what Paul suggested there. But I would, if he would amend it, uh, that we go back in July because surely it makes sense to go back in the summer to, rather than wait to later in the year. Just, uh, Councillor Paul Robinson, uh, I know you suggested September, but to keep some sort of a context in this, uh, are you happy enough with uh, Councillor Green's amendment to July? Yes, I can go with July as well. Okay. Sooner the better. I'll I just think... Give the time to get everything sorted out. That's what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, I'm assured by the Chief Executive, and to my left-hand side, this assures me that will be done if it, if it needs to be done. Yeah. That's dead okay. on. Thank you. So that's uh, July, and you're agreeing with that. That's seconded by, proposed by Councillor Paul Robinson, and is seconded by Councillor Green. Going back to the chamber here now, and we have Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I suppose two points of note there that's interesting to hear. Um, the medical expertise being expressed by some speakers uh, in contravention to the recommendations from the Department of Health at 2.3.3, noting that uh, the risk of transmission is higher at one metre compared to two metres, and again at 2.3.5, it's noted it's not anticipated that the Department of Health's view on a two metre social distancing will change in the short to medium term. It's also, uh, I suppose, a wee bit interesting on a personal note that uh, some some speakers find the the need to to be liked or to to that there be some sort of a different working relationship if people are in the chamber or people are working online. I don't understand how that's uh, important first of all, but I don't understand how it's going to impact on the business that's being done at hand. We are getting through the business, and um, sometimes we're getting through it quicker. Sometimes we're getting through it slower, but we are getting there. The online or the hybrid version despite its faults and despite its feelings does work and i think it's important to note whatever we decide that the option for signing in via uh, virtual means via a laptop or a surface pro or whatever it's a very important that that maintain that is maintained because it's not always going to suit people to come and um, time wise it's not always going to suit people who are working to come down come down the road or go up the road whatever way you're looking at it so I think regardless of the option um, or any changes proposed to social distancing within the chamber, I think it's vitally important that the option to m continue with the hybrid uh, element of the motion or of the meetings is maintained. And secondly, that the, the broadcast or the live streaming of the council meetings is maintained as, as far as I'm aware, there's no uh, additional expense to the council in terms of broadcasting uh, a video on YouTube. So I think it's hugely important that that's continued in terms of the openness, accounting, accountability and transparency of the Council. So I would just like those two points noted, Chair, that we do continue 
with the potential or the, the option to tune in hybrid, uh, through hybrid means and that we do uh, maintain or continue with our online videoing of the meetings. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McLear. I'll just bring the Chief Executive in here for clarification on those issues. Um, yes, certainly, Chair. Just in relation to the hybrid option, I suppose to note it is dependent on the legislation. The legislation is currently in place, but that is a matter for the Department for Communities. If it lapses, uh, which is possible, uh, then it would be a requirement to be in person. But that would be obviously something we could deal with at that point. And I think, Chair, we've already advised the, the streaming is something that will continue irrespective of hybrid or in-person meeting arrangements. OK, thank you. And just, just to put my own two pence worth on before I bring anyone else on here, uh, Councillor Baird had mentioned uh, people uh, pre-meeting and post-meeting. I think those of us who run in council at that time would really appreciate it, that, that even we come from different backgrounds or whatever, we could still be civil to each other. And uh, a lot of that was done pre-meeting and post-meeting. And we got on with the business when the meeting was on. So I just want to put that on there as well. Uh, back into the chamber now, and we have uh, Councillor Tommy McGuire. Thank you, Gaurav Magrini Kearney. Thanks, Chair. And, and again, I suppose I'm just seeking more clarification because there's, there's various options were proposed there. But I see in our report that if we do reduce to one metre, there'll still only be a maximum of 27 councillors available to the town hall and only 22 to 25 in the Grange. So we obviously would, that option for one metre it has within it the hybrid element, just for clarification of that, that's that's it. And just another point that was raised by the council, is there a charge for the YouTube streaming of these committee meetings? Just a, it's something I hadn't considered yeah. before. Thank Mark. you, Councillor McGuire, Chief Executive. Yes, maybe just um, one thing to clarify, that would be the total occupancy. So the 27 would be members and officers, just to note. And uh, no, we have already integrated, I suppose, we have the costs of the IT equipment and the streaming, so that would just all be, we can bring the detail of those through, but there's no additional costs at this point, Chair. Okay, thanks, Alison. Um, back now, uh, still a number of speakers to come in via WebEx, so I'm going to dedicate myself to WebEx now for the next number of minutes. Uh, first of all is Councillor Dr Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, may I offer my congratulations to you on being elected as Chair of the Policy and Resources Committee, and I uh, wish you well uh, in the upcoming year. Uh, Chair, this is a very interesting uh, debate, and I fully understand the sentiments of people who feel that face-to-face -face, uh, meetings um, are better for um, developing relationships and so on. Um, I, I would like to remind members, uh, however, that COVID is still with us. Thankfully, the severity of illness that it causes uh, is greatly reduced by the uh, uptick of the uh, COVID vaccination programme and boosters. Uh, and we're fortunate in that regard. There is no doubt that maintaining the two metre social distance will reduce the transmission of the virus and I would be keen to see uh, that uh, two metre social distance uh, uh, being maintained. Um, I think it is appropriate uh, that we should continue with the hybrid meetings whilst the legislation permits that um, as well as having clear advantages uh, for um, infection prevention and control. Um, as Councillor McAleer has said, it does save considerable time um, in travel and also um, reduces the cost of travel. Uh, so that is something I think is to be welcomed. And also uh, members may have medical conditions uh, which are not apparent and some patients, some members may be more vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19 infection than others. So whilst the legislation permits chair, I would be in support of continuing with the hybrid model and also continuing with the two metre uh, social distancing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dehan. Uh, and I suppose it's worth uh, clarifying the situation with regard to the different meetings that we do have. Uh, I think what we were talking about here is the full council and the main statutory committees. 
of the Council that would be in person, the, the other uh, working groups, steering groups and external bodies and subcommittees would be uh, on online, virtual. Okay, moving on to the next councillor and Spio Webex is Councillor Paul Blake. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for letting me in and wishing you all the best for the year ahead. Um, I also would be very much in agreement with Councillor Robinson and Councillor Green that if we can start back next month and having having people back because we can see it in all walks of life that people are starting to move on with their lives in whatever capacity they can while whilst doing so safely so i think it's it's, it's important as well for us as, as a body that we we start to operate like that as well uh too that if all our staff are doing that then we should be starting to do it too and i think is it's very important it mightn't be to councillor mcalear but councillor bird made a very good point about how important it is that we work as as a team collectively uh, as part of the greater good and that's what we're all trying to do as councillors in this and as you say yourself chair that the time that was spent pre and post meetings on the last mandate of the council and also there's part of this one too was that there was there was so much work that was done at that time and it was good for building relations and it's it's so important going forward as well too so that's happy to start back next month in that regard. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Blake. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Stephen Donnelly via WebEx. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And I suppose I will start by saying that whilst, of course, there will be elements of uh, the work of the Council where it will be impractical or difficult to implement the health guidance that comes through for particular circumstances. I think that where it is possible to see it implemented, that it is important that we do demonstrate a leadership role because, I mean, quite often uh, these things are being adopted outside uh, in the wider world in terms of workplaces. And I think that it is important that we do demonstrate a leadership role in that respect. And I also have to say, just in terms of the wider conversation around how we re return to work as things do progress, I think that it is important to remember around the conversation of hybrid working that actually there have been significant benefits that have been accrued and it strikes me as clear that if there are things that we are to learn from the pandemic we should also learn the lessons around how we actually improve things like work life flexibility um making sure that our workplaces are more inclusive of people with uh, difficult work-life balances such as parents uh, indeed, actually making things more inclusive for people who have to travel from uh, uh, distant rural areas, uh, which is something that is a very major concern in this particular council area. So I think that whatever way that we decide to go forward, we are going to have to maintain some element of the hybrid model to ensure that we do have inclusion, whilst also, of course, facilitating those who prefer to have the in-person meetings and model. And the final point that I would just say, Chair, is this, which is that I take on board what a lot of people are saying around um the need to, to have these in-person conversations uh, and interactions to be able to build positive relationships but equally i think that we have to accept the principle that good courtesy strong relationships and being able to work together is not something that should be contingent on physical meetings we should be able to have that whether that's in a virtual format or in a physical format because i don't think that that should be uh, i don't think physical conditions i don't think physical meetings should be a precondition of those kind of relationships and, and I think that's an important point that we need to work on the basis of. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Donnelly. Next up we have Councillor Victor Warrington via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I suppose I have a few comments to make uh, and a lot of them uh, to some degree has already been covered. Um, I suppose there's a lot of people out there who, as Councillor Deacon highlighted, is, is CEV is, is vulnerable still to the uh, to the virus, and certainly I would have come into that category my, myself. Um, but you know, as other people have said, we have to move on. Um, I would be hesitant um, to go against the 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 was coming from the Department of Health in in basically their suggestions and recommendations. At the end of the day, they are the experts and. Uh, two meters one meter whatever i suppose another thing that could have been looked at uh and it, this would be subject to to obviously cost would be to put screens up um uh, at each desk uh, between the counselors uh so therefore helping to to cut 
down the the, the spread of infection. Um, I don't know if that's something could be looked at to, uh, as what it would cost or whatever. And I suppose finally, one thing I will say, uh, pick up on something that uh, Councillor McAleer said. He mentioned basically uh, the, the hybrid meetings um, helping people to basically get into meetings, not have to travel, uh, and when it doesn't suit them to travel. At the end of the day, when we all became councillors uh, pre-COVID, you know, we all travelled to regardless of where where the meetings was um, and hybrid maybe uh, online meetings have maybe spoiled us to a degree where we can sit on our own in our own house and have our meetings that that could, it, it is certainly and, and i think the majority of councillors will agree like person in person meetings are the way to go forward on our hard to beat and at the end of the day we were all going to the chambers, whether it was Omar or in the skill. And I know certainly some of the councillors had further distances to travel than others. Uh, councillors from the garrison, uh, that area, and councillors coming from Rosslea or whatever, although I don't think we have any now. But certainly that is the points I'd like to make. Okay, thanks, Councillor Warrington. And the last two speakers by WebEx are. Councillor Keenan and then Councillor Coffey. So Councillor Eben Keenan, via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, um, I would tend to agree that I, th I think the the option of still having hybrid meetings is vital. I think we did have figures, uh, the officers gave us figures about six months ago or maybe more about the attendance, and the attendance is actually well up at the meetings, at all meetings, be because of since the hybrid meetings have come in. So that has to be that also has to be considered, you know, um, I know Victor's saying that everyone used to try and jump in the car and get out of the meetings, but it's, it obviously, it's obviously not always possible. Um, uh, if the numbers of the meetings are up via the hy hybrid, you know, it's more democratic. To, there's, there's, everybody's in there, there's more oversight. I think it definitely has to be looked at and considered. Um, so, yeah, I think the option of staying, staying with a hybrid if needed or, or wanted um, should be kept. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keenan. And the last speaker is Councillor Donald Coffey via WebEx. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm uh, so keen to uh, get back to meetings that I'm actually turned up to tonight to the chamber, and uh, uh, there was no seat for me, so I'm, I'm participating on WebEx, uh, but um, I'm in the uh, town hall. So I, 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 I see the, the need to move forward. Uh, having said that, obviously, the medical advice is very serious and needs to be considered as well. Uh, my main point really is to echo what Councillor Keenan's after saying. I think it's um, the, there is a benefit, I think, from having a hybrid approach, especially in a rural constituency or a council area. And um, I think uh, if, if there's a mechanism to enable people to attend meetings, uh, uh, maybe not having to travel as much, not having as much of a carbon footprint, then I think we need to investigate that. But um, I do think we need to move ahead now that I think society is moving ahead. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Coffey. And uh, I know you're I know you're in the building, so that's good, that's good that you're in the building anyway. So, okay, that's all, all our speakers. Can you just take down your hand there, Councillor Coffey? Thank you. Okay, we had two proposals, and first of all was uh, Councillor Irvine, and it was seconded by Councillor Baird that we look at our the, the finances of of how it's going to go forward, and then I think we're going to have to take two different votes in this because uh, Councillor Paul Robinson proposed that we go back into meetings in July at a one meter distance, and that was second by Councillor Green and supported by Councillor Blake. So uh, I think if maybe I'll, I'll bring the Chief Executive in at this stage to outline exactly uh, Councillor Irvine's proposal. Hey, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, maybe before I do, just to comment specifically on the query regarding screens and to advise that, yes, that is something we did look at. I know some chambers have installed those. Generally, it hasn't been recommended and it does also cause a glare on the cameras for streaming as well. So it wouldn't be something that we would be recommending by way of an approach. Uh, but yes, Councillor Irvine's proposal 
was that we defer the decision until we bring the cost back on essentially the differential. So the detail of the current uh, model, the costs for those, the cost then for full in-person meetings um, where members would attend, all members attend in person, and the clarification regarding the additionality of staffing required for those scenarios. Uh, we would obviously bring that to the next meeting and then you would take your decision. So essentially it's a deferral pending the receipt of financial information and you've already summarised uh, Councillor Robinson's proposal, Chair. Okay, uh, there are two separate two separate issues there, two, two different proposals. I don't think we can marry them. So we're going to have to put uh, Councillor Irvine's uh, proposal, seconded by Councillor Baird, to the meeting. Are we all agreed? No, I'm seeing dissension in the ranks. Sorry. Councillor McLaughlin, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm just seeking a, a small bit of clarity. Um, surely we're not going back to full meetings if we're ab abiding by the one metre rule, and, and that's what we're voting on with both motions. So, so Councillor Evans is, is what is the differential between the current format and the few extra councillors getting into the chamber? Is is that not the difference? And then Councillor Robinson's is that we just go ahead with the twenty odd councillors in the chamber, and the rest of us still at home, or those that those still at home that don't come to the chamber. Is that is that not what we're voting on? We're not going for just to ignore Sorry, the guys. My, my my advice and my take on it was that it's two separate issues, and I've tried to clarify that with the chief executive on this matter, and I think she's of the same thinking. There's two different proposals here we have. So, uh, and, and I know where both of them are coming from. So we're going to go to House Irvine's proposal, and I think we'll just go for a, a vote, if we can set up a vote for that. Everyone else remove their hands, or <laughs> lower your hands, please. Okay, you should have, it'll be, all up there now. Okay, I'm going to bring the Chief Executive on to uh, give a result. Thank you, Chair. So for Councillor Irvine's proposal, there were 13 votes for, 16 against, and one abstention. So that proposal falls. Okay, thank you for that. And can we set up another uh, vote here now for uh, Councillor Robinson's proposal, seconded by Councillor Green and supported by Councillor Blake? And I'll just bring in uh, Chief Executive to confirm the exact proposal. Okay, no, it's it's essentially Chair, it's the detail in the in the report. So this is to proceed uh, with um, hybrid meetings, but on a one meter social distancing basis with effect from July. So that'll be our council meeting in July. The fourth of July would be the first such meeting. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, the vote is now set up. 
Oh, no. Okay, Chief Executive is going to give the result of the vote. Hey, Chair, thank you. So that's 21 votes for, 10 votes against, and one no, non voting as opposed to abstention. So that proposal is carried. Okay, and that's, uh, that, is, that vote has been carried 21 for, 10 against, and one abstention. Thank you very much. So prepare yourselves all for the July Food Council meeting. Okay, I think it was worth uh, spending a wee bit of time on that, and I know we have lost time at the start here, but now we are uh, moving on from that. Very Sorry, important Chair, Chair, would you give me a little, Alec Baird, could I have clarification on how the numbers will be decided on on the uh, the one metre distancing rule 27 in Enniskill and 22, 25 in Oma? How will yeah. that be okay, I'll, I'll okay. bring the Chief Executive on for clarification, Mr. Do, Bird. Thank yeah, you. Chair, as we have been previously, so we will use the Dahan schedule, and the only difference is the increase now in numbers. Thank you. Makes infinite sense, Chief Executive. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bird. <laughs> Okay, um, please bear in mind, it's now three minutes past eight, so we have a lot of business to get done here. So uh, moving on to item six, and that's corporate services and governance directorate reports. And the first one is 6.1, and uh, is to consider report consultations, and it's paper B, and we're going to, get, we're going to break this down into two parts. And uh, it's over to uh, Celine. The button. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this is uh, an, an important report that uh, it's our draft consultation, firstly, uh, for members' attention on the uh, the Council's response to the consultation exercise on the review of urgent and emergency care services. Uh, the document uh, comprising our response is attached at Appendix 1. It was circulated to members last week seeking feedback and response. Uh, we did receive some feedback and the, the version that you have on decision time has been updated to reflect that feedback and there is some markup there that hopefully that is clear as well. So there are three strategic themes in, in this uh, report and they're set out at 1.2.4. Sorry, uh, yes. And then the, um, the, the council's response then notes, makes, makes comment under those three strategic priorities, as well as highlighting then issues in relation to the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, uh, communications issues, the major implications for rural residents um, concerns over the telephone first system uh, and then also general comments around the aging population and existing health inequalities in the district, the need to maintain urgent and emergency care and highlighting current community concerns about local hospital provision. Uh, we have liaised quite widely in, in developing this response and accordingly we hope that it does reflect well the, the Council's position as, as stated um, on, on, on various occasions 
Um, so pausing at that, Chair, the recommendation in relation to that item is that the Council would approve the draft response on the consultation of, of review of urgent and emergency care services in Northern Ireland, and that would allow us to make uh, the submission by the end of the month. Okay, thanks very much, Celine. Uh, looking at uh, WebEx, there's no one in the chamber wanting to speak at this moment in time. So, um, looking at WebEx, and we're looking at uh, Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I would like to thank um, Celine for her report and uh, to thank her team for producing what I feel is really an excellent uh, consultation response. Uh, Chair, as a council, we are in no doubt uh, of the importance of the outcome of this consultation. And I think this response uh, document has summarised very well uh, many of the concerns, particularly given that we are substantially a rural council, uh, that those concerns have been expressed on many occasions within uh, the council chamber, not least of which is protecting the acute services uh, which we have at the Southwest Acute Hospital. I really don't have too much to add, Chair, uh, other uh, than uh, just in terms of staffing issues and it, to ensure um, equity of pay uh, between part-time, pro rata, full-time and agency workers. I think the main issue here relates to workforce planning and to make sure that there is uh, adequate ability to staff uh, our services. Uh, so I think maybe a comment could be made on that. In relation to intermediate care, I think the points that are made in this response are good ones. Uh, intermediate care is critical in ensuring that no one needs to, uh, to remain in an acute hospital for longer than they should do. We have had discussions in the health and social care uh, a subcommittee about uh, uh, step down facilities and I believe that we need more of those uh, and finally then chair um, the the whole premise of providing care close to the patient should also include strengthening of the rapid response uh, team which does pr pr uh, provide excellent care at home for uh, patients in need and also increased provision of acute care at home, uh, which we certainly don't have at present in the OMA area and, and minimally in the Enniskillen area. So other than those few comments, Chair, um, I am happy to um, propose that we accept this consultation document. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Dr. Dehan. Now back to the Chamber and we have Councillor Barry McAdoff. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm interested in the mental health section of this response and uh, it refers to the fact that the council is disappointed to learn that mental health appears to be outside the remit of this review and then it talks about services may not be as efficient in our council area as, as they should be and there's two points I would like to raise there uh, and it might involve as well do propose right into the trust on this one would be to establish in relation to Elm, Lyme and Rathview in Oma, has there been a reduction in beds in recent times there from uh, 26 downwards? And is there the use of chair beds as distinct from uh, beds proper? And why is that practice taking place? Why is that continuing? And then secondly, my question would be, um, people from the OMA area who seek help out of ours um, are being advised or directed to go to the Southwest Acute Hospital, but the person attending to them also travels from OMA to the Southwest Acute Hospital in Enniskillen. And I would like to an explanation as to why is that the case. So we're talking about efficiency, both the patient and the health professional, both traveling to OMA from Enniskillen in the middle of the night um, in out of hours urgent situations. Um, I'd just like an explanation for that built in as well, if that could be achieved. 
in, in my proposal to write to the Trust. And if there's anything from that that could find its way into that report, then so be it. But I would second I would second the proposal. I haven't made those additional comments. Okay, thanks, Councillor McAdoff. You're seconding the, the initial proposal as proposed by Councillor Dr. Dayton. And you're making a separate proposal to write to the Western Health and Social Care Trust uh, with regard to Elm, Lyme, and Rathview uh, less beds issue. Okay. Happy enough, Celine, yep. that? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go on now to uh, Chamber again, and it's Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. No, um, Councillor McAlduff raised a, a number of very good points there, and I, if need be, I'm happy to, to second his proposals and maybe. With the, the addition, just a, a separate question or a follow on question in relation to um, CAMS provision uh, across uh, the district as well. Um, just really to get a feel for uh, staffing provision at present and the, I suppose, the, the training which has been provided to the staff currently working in that area. Because again, when you're talking about mental health, it's something that's extremely important. And I'm hearing stories of. Uh, serious issues in terms of uh, waiting lists and, and not only that but actually the, the stoppage of waiting lists because the the backlog is getting so serious so uh, massive massive concern um not helped in any way by the the last couple of years of the pandemic and and various lockdowns and that so i think it's something that really needs to be addressed when we when we deal with the the mental health aspect of this document so if that would be included or addressed as well i'd appreciate that thank you chair Okay, so you're seconding Councillor McAdolph's proposal uh, with regard to the trust, and you're, you're adding that, your own piece on there as well. Are you happy to accept that? Okay. Okay, we go back to uh, WebEx now. We have Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I just want to start off by saying that I think this is a very strong. Uh, reiterating my uh, the opinion expressed by Councillor Dehan there that this is a very strong response and I'm glad to see uh, that the, the comments that I'd sent in uh, which were mainly, mainly additional um, have been fully integrated. Uh, I think it is hugely concerning that we're seeing uh, this approach. Uh, there's an element of crisis management about the the entire need for a review at this stage. Uh, the statistics confirm that even over the last year, the the attendances at uh, A and E services have gone up right across the board. That reflects the pressure on GP frontline GP services, and it is notable that the increase has been uh, greater than average in uh, the Southwest Acute Hospital. Uh, the response we've prepared addresses a large number of concerning areas and also identifies areas where we need to see action, certainly the issue of uh, pay for uh, frontline workers, but also care workers is addressed and conditions and so on. These are vital constraints on labor force. The labor force development is also touched upon, and I think that's very important as well. One of the most concerning developments, I think, around um, the whole uh, discussion and narrative on a &E is this new division into type one, two, and three, uh, wherein uh, type one is a, what we would call an A&E, type two is an A&E minus effectively uh, emergency surgery, such as now is in the case of Daisy Hill Hospital in Nuri. Type three is what we would be talking about, a degraded, uh, like a, an emergency sort of, uh, an urgent care unit or whatever. With that in mind, I just, I think there may be a typo at the bottom of uh, page three, where there's now a footnote referencing a type four A and E department, which I don't think uh, is necessary, or uh, I don't know why that's in there. I think there's only three types from everything I've read on it, but uh, if someone could check that. But um, the statistics confirm that uh, the numbers attending in our A and E's uh, uh, at the moment are among the lowest, and with the mindset that is characterised by uh, this idea that you should be able to travel. Uh, for the most appropriate care. This doesn't work with uh, acute services and emergency services in particular. I have to commend the references to the uh, the academic research, for example, Kelly and Boone, Hostiger and Pieper in 2020, which we have included in this, which highlights that there is actually a link 
between travel time and better outcomes. That's something. Twenty seconds, councillor. Twenty seconds. Everyone knows that to be true, and it's important that we stand over it. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Coffey. And last speaker in this issue is Councillor Victor Warrington, Bioevix. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, like I think everything has been highlighted in the previous speakers. Uh, I've read this, and it's certainly quite a strong uh, response on it, uh, with a lot of good points. I suppose the only thing that maybe uh, wasn't uh, highlighted, maybe, uh, was the uh, out of hours uh, in our area, which is uh, obviously needs. Um, certainly looked at uh, as we go forward, but as a document, very well documented and well done to all those involved with putting it uh, together. Thank you. Thank you. Can, well, can I just say at this juncture, uh, just remind councillors that this uh, consultation went out uh, some time ago, and uh, the director and myself discussed it earlier on. There were a couple of councillors came back with uh, feedback on it, and it has been included. So I think that's the key as we move forward in consultations, is please do take part. And uh, if you have anything uh, to say, put it in writing, and that we can get it dealt with a, a bit more quickly. OK, uh, just with regard to the document itself, it's been proposed by Councillor Dr. Dehan, seconded by Councillor Barry McAdoff. I take it we're all agreed. And there's a secondary to that, and that's uh, proposed that we write to the Western Health and Social Care Trust uh, by Councillor McAdoff, seconded by Councillor McAleer, and that's regarding Elm, Lyme, and Rathview uh, less beds, and Councillor McAleer's uh, issues that he had also raised there. So I take it we're, we're all agreed there. Okay, that's, uh, that's Appendix 1 it is approved, uh, Celine. And we go on to Appendix 2. Thank you, Chair. So, um, well, Appendix 2 relates to 3.1 of the report, and the following items are all for information. Um, this was a summary response of a matter discussed at last month's meeting, um, a new and better normal report issued by the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. And uh, just for, for members' information, there's information about the consultation previously um, approved by the committee, which has been submitted, and then information for your attention on a series of forthcoming consultations and uh, just for by way of navigation uh, if you download the, the the report and then click on the um on the title area it will take you directly into the the relevant consultation information and uh, members may wish to have have a look through those um and then some we will be bringing back consultation draft responses where appropriate so that takes us to 11.2, which is uh, that all of that information then is, is noted. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Celine, for that. And bear in mind, councillors, before I bring anyone in, this is for noting, and I want to propose her and second her for noting before any other comments are made. And go to the chamber now, and we have uh, Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Director for bringing the report back to us. It was uh, myself that had requested or uh, proposed that we actually support this as opposed to just um, noting it. So forgive me for, for not wanting to just note it. I think we need to actually support this document and not an We have, but it's, as it is, well, it's the document here. Can we have a noting of it first, and then if you want to make well, comments? Well, yeah, happy, happy, to, happy enough to note it with that, okay. with that information, Chair. And, and I would propose, <coughs> excuse me, I would propose that we actually contact the executive, uh, noting our support and asking and urging them to implement that this as a as a matter of urgency, because it is a, a hugely important issue when dealing with the the young people that that are not just within this district, but but right across the the north here. Um. In relation to uh, the notes on the, the, the mineral prospecting licences, I would actually urge that we uh, contact the department to state our strong opposition to those. Um, I note that there is a, a slight typo in terms of the date, uh, 5.4.1 there. It should be the, the 20th of August. Sorry, Councillor McAuley, I've been advised this is coming forward to again, again as Celine had already indicated, and Alison's just confirmed coming forward to the July 2022 meeting. Right. Well, Chair, I, I would just, I'll finish up, but I would just make a, a note or a, an observation that, that again, 
this district and west of the ban seems to be a sacrificial zone for these extractive industries, these toxic industries. We are promoting tourism, we are promoting agriculture and fishing here, and yet we are bomb bomb being bombarded with an influx of these toxic industries. And uh, I will uh, I'll pass on some documentation I've got from DFE. I'd requested a breakdown of the, the coverage at present of our district area, um, Straban and Derry, City uh, District area and Mid Ulster, of uh, the, the current active uh, mineral permissions. And it's quite shocking when you actually see that in black and white chair. So I'll, I'll pass that round members. But when you hear or see uh, in black and white that over a quarter of our own district area is currently under prospecting licensing uh, for these toxic poisonous industries, it is really quite concerning. And I do think we need to be making a massive statement of opposition to this. And uh, I'll leave it at that for now, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. No more. The other councillors want to come in here. Uh, BioWebX, Councillor Heard Thornton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm quite happy to second the noting of the contents of 11.2. Okay. Thank you. And next up, we have Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and uh, being that this has been noted, uh, I'll just keep my uh, words brief. Uh, I think that uh, there is a genuine concern, I think, that our, our council area is now exactly, has been stated there, becoming a sacrificial zone for uh, what are quite toxic industries. Uh, uh, many of the practices, these are intense industries uh, involving very, um, you know, extreme processes and uh, very, you know, a lot of chemical extractive uh, procedures, uh, and all of this uh, involves mining. Uh, it involves um, removing materials from deep underneath us in an area which is high radon, high uh, natural radioactivity, high. Uh, uh, we know that there's uh, there is heavy metals because they are going for them, and these things also cause uh, a variety of diseases if they're released. Uh, these are all for-profit operations. We can anticipate how they're going to handle health and safety. We can anticipate that they're short-termism. We can anticipate many uh, negatives. And I don't see really why we as a community have to suffer this when what we want to do is actually position ourselves as a, a clean environment with a strong, clean agricultural, tourist, uh, you know, environmental product, so many things going for this area, clean water, clean air. We've got so much going and we don't want to mortgage it and mortgage the future of future, genera uh, the future generations to come. So I, oh. I, I entirely agree with Councillor McAleer, second oh. his proposal that we should strongly oppose these industries. Thank you, Chair. Uh, please bear in mind, Councillor Coffey, that this is coming up in July 2022 again for, for further actions. So, uh, we can bring the chief executive and maybe to clarify the situation here with that. No, well, well, Chair, just to confirm, as you've indicated, this was discussed at the council meeting last week. It was the correspondence was noted and advised that responses would be brought to the July committee uh, schedule. I suppose it's worth noting for the record that the council has always opposed these mineral applications. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sure, we're all agreed there, not. I've been off of Sleen with, with that. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, now we're moving on to uh, Councillor Warrington, Councillor Swift. You have your hands up. We're moving on. If you can lower your hands, please. Moving on to 6.2, and that's to consider the report on rural needs annual monitoring report 2021 to 2022, paper C. Chair, this provides information on the Council's own. Uh, responsibility and action in relation to rural proofing. So it, it doesn't look at other organisations, it does look at what we have done. So over the course of the last year, we have, uh, we have completed eight rural proofing exercises in connection with specific policies that the Council has uh, considered or reviewed. And the detail of those eight policies is set out in Appendix 1. And you can see that those policies um, range from assisted bin lift uh, through the corporate funding policy, fraud and corruption, 
mobile and smart device raising concerns. So they are, a number of them are corporate policies, and in the majority of cases, the conclusion is that they will be applied consistently across the piece and uh, you know, have, have limited uh, impact in terms of whether it's, it's rural or um, a more urban issue. They, they will be applied equally to both employees and where appropriate to, to the public. Um, I, I'm hoping that this was uh, highlighted at the uh, the last Rural Needs um, Subcommittee, uh, but this is a formal process that the Council makes a return to DERA in connection with this work uh, by the end of, of the month. So we are seeking your approval of our annual monitoring report on rural needs for submission to DERA. Thank you very much, Celine, and uh, two councillors via WebEx, no one in the chamber. Via WebEx, we have Councillor Bernice Swift. Yeah, Garmaga Kerlock, and yes, Celine, uh, I'm satisfied with all of this, and it's fundamental that the response goes straight back to DERA on all of the matters outlined. Thank you for that report. And just further uh, highlight as well, just on the previous report too, to that uh, it would be appropriate that all members bear in mind the motion that was passed nearly this time last year on the rights of nature as well. And I'm glad that we remain with our fixed position on being opposed to any uh, extravation in our council area. Gurmagat. Okay, you're, you're proposing the uh, 6.2 then? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up via WebEx, we have Councillor Donald Coffey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm happy to second uh, that. Um, I just wanted to highlight that I think we hear a lot of talk about uh, the need for, you know, rural proofing. Uh, almost uh, in, at times you hear it's like a panacea. Uh, the reality is uh, I think it's very much untested. I, uh, in particular, uh, paragraph 1.3 states that the acts, uh, Act introduced a statutory duty blah, 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 to have due regard to rural needs. Now, due regard, that, what does that really mean? And I think when it comes down to it, these words mean very little. Uh, in many uh, cases, as we all know, uh, rural needs are uh, basically, I would say, the uh, this, this mechanism is largely, unfortunately for many bodies out there, a box taking exercise. And uh, I think that this, uh, this, this description highlights just how meaningless the protections are the storm it have provided to date for rural communities. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So that's proposed and seconded. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Thanks, Celine, for that. On to uh, item 6.3 and to consider the report on revised volunteer policy and it's paper D. And again, it's over to Celine. Chair, members, this is an update of the Council's volunteer policy. Um, it's been updated to reflect some practical issues um, around arrangements in, in the context of the pandemic, um, and also just a general update to reflect uh, some Council uh, can, uh, other related items that uh, the corporate plan, etc., that have been updated in, since it was last prepared. So uh, the, at Appendix 1, you have the marked up version of the, uh, of the policy, and uh, we are seeking your approval of that revised policy. We've taken the opportunity as well to highlight some of the volunteering work that is, is going on in the Council and uh, the, the, um, the important opportunities that it does offer to many of our community who, who do actually enjoy um, becoming involved in, in some aspect of, of uh, public life and work. Uh, and uh, we have a current uh, opportunities that uh, have been recently launched as part of Volunteer Week. So uh, that's for information, which is the second part of this report. So I'd be happy to deal with any queries. Okay, thanks very much, Celine. And thanks, thanks for all the work and you and the team and the document as well. Excellent. Uh, Okay, we're looking for a proposal and seconder for the approval and adoption. Councillor Paul Robinson via WebEx is proposing. Proposed. Second, seconded by uh, Councillor Robert Irvine in the chamber. Just going to bring Councillor Emmett McAleer in uh, for comment. Thank you, Chair. No, I'm happy enough to, to support as outlined there. I'm just in relation to item 12 and training, I'm presuming that would include. Um, likes of uh, access NIE and, and different um, 
background checks or, or would that be under nine uh, in terms of just depending what role the, the volunteers were carrying out? And secondly, just under point nine itself, there's a couple of corrections um, amended or changed and highlighted in red. Um, volunteer supervisor, just the, the capital V seems to have been uh, put into lowercase, but the supervisor doesn't seem to have been. So just to, I suppose, to have a bit of uniformity there, I presume they should either both be capitalised or both be in lowercase. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm sure that'll it'll be corrected accordingly. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. So that's agreed. Uh, moving on now to uh, 6.4, and consider, consider the report on draft financial position for the year ended 31st of March 2022, and as paper E, and as over to Celine. Yes, Chair, thank you. And members, this paper, uh, again, is quite an important one, which gives you up to date information of the overall management accounts financial position for the year ended 31st of March 2022. Uh, please bear with me. There's there's a lot of figures in this. I refer you first of all to the uh, the appendix, which gives a summary of that. Um, we have also provided on decision time a detailed breakdown by cost centre um, of the of the how these figures then comprise by by service area. So that may be of interest and relevance to to members. Um, obviously, there's uh, it's it's a quite another level of detail again. Um, in summary, this uh, is another year where the budgeted figures and the actual outturn are quite different in many respects due to uh, a number of factors. And um, those are outlined at, at paragraph 2.3. Um, there has been additional income. A lot of that has come from central government uh, by way of um, Department for Communities funding, additional revitalization and tourism grants additional funding from the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs uh, in relation to COVID uh, costs, uh, and then um, some additional income that has been raised uh, through service income. Um, when I say additional income, uh, it has recovered to a, a level better than what we had originally budgeted for the year. Uh, there was some additional uh, leisure and arts income and uh, that totals 3.3 million in, in total, which is, is a significant sum. Uh, there's just over half a million of savings in staff costs. Members will be aware that there has been quite a, a bit of transition and a uh, number of staff have retired and there has been changes to the structure. So over the course of that 12 month period, there were uh, temporary vacancies um, and the organization structure review. And so there was uh, significant underspends there. Uh, there was also some less casual costs because of the ongoing closure of leisure and arts facilities. Um, whilst there were some additional costs and additional casual staff costs in areas such as waste, um, where, where there was um, additional service requirements uh, again. So um, in terms of the operating costs, there have been savings of £780,000. Those have been consistently reported during the year. Um, they do relate quite a bit to redux reductions in service delivery, where, for example, events or programmes were not able to be delivered during the, the COVID period. And just bearing in mind, this, these figures are from the 1st of April 2021 to the 31st of March 2022. So there was significant lockdown periods of, of varying degrees uh, during that. Uh, that time. So there has been then some savings in utility costs. Um, I'm sure that will certainly go the other way this year. Uh, and also then overall in the council savings and travel and other uh, related administration costs of 140,000. So um, all of that is, is to our benefit. Um, and then in addition, we have had some there has been some um, additional rates income in relation to the settlement of the actual penny product. However, we do have some concerns about that because there are still estimations around a recoverable debt, which is, is very much an uncertainty. Uh, some, as part of our management accounts reporting during the year, uh, some decisions have been made uh, around uh, where some of these monies have, have been allocated and uh, it, it's now appropriate that we, we, we finalise those. 
Another factor has been the Council's decision around establishing the Strategic Capital Fund um, on, in the sum of 1.2 million. And essentially, when that amount of money is uh, is set aside, and uh, the, the the sum that was received from the, the Department for Communities, which was under an accounts direction to uh, to be transferred to a, spe a specified reserve, uh, when we make the additional um, transfers that were agreed as originally in in our estimates, uh, really that's that's where we're at. Um, so. That, that accounts for, for most everything in, in this particular year, which is probably the first time in, in a few years. We've, we've always had a bit more to come and go on, but as I say, the, the 1.2 million has certainly uh, dealt with, uh, the, the you know, has, has taken up some of that additional income and uh, the surpluses that have, have been generated. Uh, so it it's overall it it is it is a, a good positive performance. Um, we we after making those adjustments, we're still reporting a surplus of of one hundred and nine thousand, and this will be added to the general fund and take that takes it just to a, a figure of just over four million four million ninety seven thousand and three hundred and eleven pounds. Um, that is the the detail of of the management of the revenue management accounts. Attached to Appendix 2 is the capital expenditure for the year and the capital investment that has been delivered across the district uh, for the 12 months to March 2022 uh, is just under £10.6 million. Uh, there, is a, there was an additional 400000 um, against some of our aspects of our original capital budget, budget which has been designated as repair expenditure and charge to revenue. So what we're looking at is, is total investment of in, in the region of 11 million pounds. But I think, and, and that is again a very positive um, outcome. The most important thing here though is to note that over 60% of that was funded through external grants. Uh, so that means that we are not using ratepayers' money, essentially. We are getting it funded from other sources. Uh, that has been a deliberate um, approach and strategy and one that has worked quite well for, for this council. Um, so that gives you the detail on the capital expenditure. There are then our complex figures around uh, how that is financed and funded and the drawdown of reserves and monies allocated towards it, which is, is, is all provided for you there. The third item in this report then is comment around the, the statement of accounts, which is the, the Council's published accounts, because whenever we complete the management accounts, there then are a number of adjustments that have to be done for what are described as non-cash items. So those relate primarily to um, where there's adjustments for potential, potential pension liabilities in the future. Uh, where there's adjustments for depreciation and revaluation of properties. And the third area is around the um, accounting for closure and aftercare of landfill sites. And I do have an update on that in that we have been doing some further ongoing work there. And essentially that is a, a civil engineering project and we are close to the closure uh, timescale for Drummy landfill site in particular. And as a result of that being quite close and the current market environment in, in relation to any type of, of capital projects, it is likely that we will have to increase our aftercare provision quite significantly, um, possibly in the region of up to half a million pounds. So uh, that will also now have to be funded through our, our capital programme uh, and our capital reserves. So another draw on, on these existing uh, monies that, that, that we have set aside. Uh, what we do propose to do there is to bring a, a review, an early review of the capital programme, uh, just to take stock on where we are, because we, we are aware that there's a number of projects have come in over budget. Equally, there's been some delays and some, so I think it is prudent that we would, we would re revisit that. Um, normally, we would do that around uh, at the start of the next calendar year, but I think we'd hope to do that in the autumn time. So, a lot of information here for you members um, I'm, I am happy to deal with any queries uh, but just to to highlight to you that there is further management accounting information providing uh, quite a, a level of detail further um, in, in relation to all aspects of, of the council's actual and budget performance uh, that is, is, is available to members. So um, Really, I suppose, moving to the recommendations, it is to note the financial position to approve the various transfers to and from that have been agreed and, and proposed. Um, to note reliance on third party advice and expertise 
in relation to some of these complex accounting issues and then that you uh, approve that we would proceed to finalise these uh, unaudited accounts and the work is still going on in that and, and, uh, and it is quite um, quite challenging this year in terms of timescales uh, but those need to be signed by uh, Alison as Chief Financial Officer and submitted to the Department uh, for Communities and also to the Northern Ireland Audit Office on or before the 30th of June. So. Um, we would provide that information uh, again that would it would be made available to members at, at that date and also to members of the audit panel who have had sight of, of this information too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, okay, a couple of speakers here and obviously remind people that they, there are four four parts of the recommendation. Now over to Councillor Barry McAdoff in the Chamber. Hold on, I'll get you switched in. Oh. Thanks, Chair. And... Uh, and Celine on that report very detailed. There was one theme I think was very positive too was um, the emphasis on trying to secure funding from external grants sources and uh, remember in Kevin O'Gara's time as a director how pleased he and the team was at the achievement of particular funding to do with Court Rush in OMA and I remember it was significant funding and it was like a, an achievement, uh, and it was as if it was a colleague maybe within his team or uh, who, who, who kind of led on that type of thing. I got that impression. But is it a whole council culture across the four directorates that we should make maximum effort to secure external funding? And even at a local level, uh, Chair will be aware of this, when you hear things like, you know, MACA were able to get a project worker through the National Lottery, all that kind of thing, you know. So just seek an assurance that uh, I remember Josephine Trenner being delighted at that achievement, you know. Uh, took a while, happened, and it benefited that community. Um, so I'm just seeking assurance that that's a whole council, plus the four directorates, uh, kind of culture and emphasis. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Are you happy to propose the recommendations as well just as that Happy to propose the recommendations, yep. Okay. Uh, Celine, do you want to come back in? Yes, Chair. I, I think the Appendix 2 does evidence a whole council approach because, as you can see, um, if you look down the capital spend column, which is the first column, and if you look down the external grant, uh, you can see that it is attributable to almost every project. Um, the only thing we haven't really been able to get anybody to pay for are some of our vehicles yet. Uh, so uh, um, that's that's a bit of a toughie, so it is. Um, but it is led, uh, that that effort uh, as well. There There is, um, our capital unit have, have been very active in, in that area. So, uh, but it is, is fairly consistently right across um, all, all areas and, and all types of projects. Um, not always guaranteed and, and not something we can we can say, but it is it is a priority for us and it is a priority for our projects. And and again, just to emphasize that is part of the reason why the uh, the, the actual revenue estimates are good as well, because we're not having to use and draw down other monies against that. OK, thanks, uh, Celine, for that. And into the chamber again, we have Councillor Robert Irvine. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Just echo Councillor Michael Duff's um, comments in regard to the drawdown of funding for capital projects. I have a particular bugbear in that we need to be underpinning our um, revenue side as well uh, by lobbying uh, central government for certain amounts of the works. I won't rehearse what they are because um, members in the chamber will know uh, a few things that I've been harping on about. Um, I would like to compliment Celine and the staff down through uh, Catherine as well. Um, it's not easy keeping track of 40 million. <laughs> um, and it's good to see that uh, when we have estimates and we chew them over, as we do prior to setting the rate, that there are variances, and thankfully the variances are upwards rather than downwards. Um, because as they say in the financial words, um, investments can go up, but they can go down as well. So we shouldn't always expect um, surpluses coming in, uh, but that's the way of it. It's very good. Uh, I'm glad that we're carrying through on the decision we took for the last couple of years in that in the main, any declared surpluses 
will be transferred into reserves, particularly in regard to going against capital, because we have a very challenging capital programme going forward, and none more so than seeing some of the return costs under the tenders uh, later on. The environment that uh, we are experiences, uh, experiencing at the moment is challenging for everybody, but it's challenging for us as a public body. So well done to the team, and, and I'm happy to second the proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Irving, for your comments and for your seconding. Okay, uh, into the Chamber again, we have Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Director for the, as you say, the, the comprehensive report. <clears throat> Just looking at uh, some of the figures, and, and as has been alluded to, some of the, the savings. Um, looking at waste and recycling there, a saving of over 184,000, leisure, recreational, sport, 614 plus thousand, um, democratic and customer services, 204,000. I'm wondering, has there been any um, allocation or any inclusion of additional pay for some of our council staff, given that there are such um, noticeable savings across the board? Is that something that's normally budgeted for or um, just being mindful of, of ongoing issues at, at present? Is that something that could be maybe alleviated um, with some of the savings that we're seeing here? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for your comments, Councillor McAleer. Celine? Chair, again, um, I suppose just to reiterate, I, I wouldn't necessarily describe all of these as savings. I would say that there has been under delivery of services in a number of areas due to the COVID situation. And that means that the money that the council allocated to spend in those areas wasn't spent. Um, so there was a, effectively a reduced subsidy in some areas. In other areas, the income has been more positive than what we had originally intended. And uh, then there is the third element then is some of the uh, where we've had staff vacancies, which have now been filled for the most part. So that's not an ongoing um, uh, a saving as such. So it, it really, it, I, I would hesitate to use the word saving. It, it reflects the picture of how the actual turnout was against the original budget and as for many reasons it, it, it was quite different but we did try to keep it managed um, overall. In connection with, with what has been provided for, we have provided in full for um, what has been what is due um, including any outstanding holiday pay, any outstanding allowances and indeed any um, agreed in inflationary um, increases and other increments uh, that, that are due. It's not possible for us to speculate and make any provision over and above that. Um, in terms of, uh, I suppose, if the member's alluding to the, the issue of the industrial dispute, again, that's something that we will have to work through, but we can't make provision in these figures, not least because there's nothing left. We've now sort of allocated where things are going to go to, including the 1.2 million, et cetera. Um, so that remains an issue and effectively an uncertainty, which I'll, I'll come on to maybe in the next paper as well. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that that explains that all provisions and all um, items that need to be provided for and accrued up to the 31st of March have been included in, in these figures. I say all, but the auditors will probably come along and find something else they want adjusted as such, but um, that, uh, that, that is what the basis of these, these figures here. Thank you very much. Um, last speaker on BioEvix is Councillor Donald Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, before I start, if I had it proceeded, I'd have had to declare an interest. But I, I, I just got, I didn't because uh, I was getting set up in here. I was unable to declare an interest for uh, items six point five and six point seven in relation to industrial matters. Um, just I, I'm not going to speak. I, I want to ask two uh, completely unrelated questions around the finances, though. Um, the first is. Uh, there's a lot of detail in this, and I, I, I have to congratulate those who maintain these accounts. That uh, it is it's certainly not uh, difficult. And I do look forward, and I will look uh, when I get a bit of time into the detail of it, because I think that's quite genuinely informative about the whole gamut of activities that we as a council 
have been able to take forward, especially at a time when many things were uh, in lockdown and so on. Uh, the two questions I have really is not so much uh, looking backwards, but uh, what we can learn in terms of looking forwards. Uh, mm -hmm. The first is around um, the indicative rates uh, issue, which I note uh, in the text and also in Celine's exp explanation. There's a, a, a matter of um, uncertainty and it won't be confirmed for a while. Is there any, I, I'm unaware of this, maybe there is, but are there any uh, studies uh, conducted by the department at this stage which may provide an estimate of the impact, for example, of the COVID pandemic and subsequent uncertainties in the economy upon the rates going into the future? So I'm just wondering if, because uh, obviously there's this uncertainty about the past, but there's even more uncertainty about the future. I know there's some form of a guarantee, but um, maybe there may be a bit more information on that. The second question is really uh, in section 2.3. There's a lot of uh, detail there around how the uh, council managed to end up so much uh, up on uh, its pre previous estimates, but one of which was the 700,000 due to uh, vacancies and organizational reviews and so on. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion, uh, or at least had been a lot of discussion on um, efficiency gains uh, through management um, restructuring and um, genuine efficiency uh, maneuvers. I, I'm just wondering, is there anything, uh, is there like a report likely to come forward on these? Because you can see the scale of what can be achieved, even with transitions and the absence of people from certain posts for a period. But imagine if we actually uh, were able to genuinely achieve uh, efficiencies at the, uh, at the highest level, uh, or not the highest, but at high enough, high, relatively high levels, uh, I, I think that this would be uh, quite a dramatic improvement for us. So uh, those two questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner Coffey. Celine? Chair, uh, members, so first of all, in relation to the rates issue, I would say that we do maintain close ongoing contact with Land and Property Service, who manage the, the, the rates, the rating, and uh, also the rates collection process. Um, a lot of the funding that, or, or certainly some of the funding that the department has allocated to us has been specifically around um, rates uncertainty, or that has been a factor that has been mentioned. So they, the department is not unaware of it. Um, member asked about any studies that had been completed. Um, back in 2020, at, at, I suppose not at the outset of the COVID, but about six months into the pandemic situation, there was a study completed um, by the Univer Ulster University Economic Policy Centre, um, and they had estimated different scenarios ranging up to potentially 4% of, uh, of a reduction. That, however, probably would be out of date now, and they did do some sectoral analysis, but it is something that we could possibly take forward and, and ask to see if there's merit in, in that maybe being updated. The, the difficulty with the rates is that it can be it can even be into years before all of these uncertainties are realised um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the, uh, the appeals process uh, against rates is, is quite a protracted um, issue and uh, members may recall there was Reval 2020, which um, revalued uh, business uh, non-domestic rates at the 1st of April 2020, which was literally at the start of the pandemic period. Now, it's my understanding that there's a further reval proposed, um, but at, you know that in itself may lead to some, you know, some adjustment down the line that that we're not, not not clear on. The second issue in relation to domestic rates is where uh, there's non-payment, and uh, again that hasn't been really um, progressed through courts or or anywhere at this point in time. There's there's a number of delays in the, in, in the system, so. Um, there, there is a slight nervousness and, and, and certainly an uncertainty there. Um, in terms of the issue around um, re organisational restructuring and potential efficiency gains, it would certainly be the, the practice that there would be some, uh, there would be a look back and, and there would be a post-project evaluation on that. Um, that hasn't been completed yet. It will probably be a few months before it will be completed because there is other priorities at, at the moment. Um, it would be remiss of me to, uh, I suppose, not make members aware that really we did, um, we did 
over the course of the 21-22, we had some quite significant gaping vacancies. And, and if you will recall, for a period of time, I covered two directors' roles. So, I mean, it, it wouldn't be necessarily the case that we would be able to just produce those type of savings, um, uh, you know, without very significant impact on services itself. So, um, I, I think that is is worth noting. It's not that there's there's any. Um, you know, there's any staff that are are not required or needed in 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 that sense. We're 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 not. Um, we wouldn't do that. Just simply, it. it uh, uh, so, I hope that that has addressed the members' queries to some degree. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Celine. Hopefully, you're happy enough with that, Councillor Coffey. Okay. It's been proposed and seconded. Uh, Proposed by Councillor McAdoff, seconded by Councillor Irvine. We all agreed. Okay, thank you. On to item uh, six point five, and that's to consider consider a report on annual governance statement for Fermanagh and Dublin District Council for the year ended the thirty first of March twenty twenty two, and as paper F, and I believe that uh, Councillor Green was the chair of that committee. Uh, Celine. Chair, equally, this now reports on the Council's governance arrangements for the 21-22 year. And in good governance, we hear a lot about it. It's, it's an important issue. It's about having the right um, arrangements and procedures in place to, uh, to run the Council as an organisation um, in, in a, a proper manner and uh, in, in a, with proprietary and, and stewardship and all of the, of the right processes around that. So attached to Appendix 1 is the Council's draft annual governance statement for the year. It will it comprises one of the key statements in our published accounts. Our published accounts, uh, just that members are familiar with the cycle, will be published before the end of September. Um, before that, they will be subject to audit um, by the Northern Ireland Audit Office. And they are submitted now to the Audit Office by the end of June. And that audit work will take place then over the summer. Uh, so this is certainly one of the areas that they will look at. Uh, and as you can see, there's a whole list there and uh, there's a bullet point list at 2.3, which sets out uh, all of the, the governance procedures and arrangements that we have in place. Uh, the area I want to direct members' attention to is uh, paragraph 2.7 in the covering report uh, or in the, the final section of the annual governance statement itself which is entitled significant governance issues and it starts on page 10 of the the governance statement as it is numbered uh, and it runs for about a page and a half and this highlights six issues that we are highlighting as being of concern or risk to the council at the moment the first is around the pandemic response and recovery so although things are moving towards normality um, there still is there still is the potential for for issues there around um, well again the pandemic itself our emergency plans have now moved to a standby situation but again now the uh, following the the health guidelines which as we've even heard tonight is uh, remains a, a, a challenging issue and uh, then all of the financials that we've just touched on there. Um, in summary, we have received £12.4 million over the last two years of exceptional funding, um, some of which is directly related to loss of income, some of it relates to additional costs that we incurred, some of it is for community revitalisation, some of it um, is for other recovery purposes um, going forward and looking into the future. Almost related to that is the second risk around financial uncertainties, um, but it's then drawing out the rate space that we've just talked about and also um, uncertainty or pressures on, on central government budgets, which do make a contribution to the overall uh, council income as well. We're also referencing there um, the current cost environment, the very uh, the inflationary environment, which uh, is, is relevant to the council as well as to um, the district and ratepayers, uh, etc., and all of the factors there that have driven up prices, in particular in relation to energy, capital, um, fuel, materials, and so also some service costs. Um, so it's it's there's there's a lot of of moving pieces there around uh, the finances, but we are working to establish a reserve policy and manage those reserves to uh, to deal with 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 those pressures and fluctuations. 
The third risk that is identified is around cybersecurity, an important issue for any uh, particularly public uh, bodies and, and organisations, and also then digital services. And the digital services uh, fact relates to two significant IT projects that we're currently involved in. One has been around our finance system and uh, our human resource system, and the second is around uh, the new planning portal system. So all of those increase the risks uh, around being able to deliver the council services well. The fourth issue is about legal issues. Um, over the last year, there, there was a, an external judicial review which uh, meant that we had to change our standing orders around the, the decision-making of planning. Um, there is an increasing number of judicial review actions, and there's also, particularly in relation to planning, quite an increase in enforcement action. Um, there's scope for additional legal challenges on, on many different issues. We do try to mitigate against that, but we do need to be mindful that each and every one of these legal actions is costly. Um, both in financial and monetary terms, and also in in uh, in terms of officer time and time that they could be doing on, on on other things. The fifth risk issue is around climate change. We have produced a strategy and an action plan. Um, it has extremely challenging targets in it. Uh, we're saying that the council will operate by 2036 on a net carbon zero basis, and the district by 2042. Um, that will require some very difficult decisions around how we approach things like energy. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not all going to be able to be mitigated. Um, so it, it will be, uh, well, also there, there is a lot of resource implications for that. Um, and whilst it is very much the right thing to do, we, we will need to see whole scale changes in behaviours um, in terms of the council approach and then uh, right across our district. And the final, um, I suppose, particular issue of risk that, that we've identified at this time is around industrial relations and uh, the, the information there is provided on the, uh, the recent strike action, the dispute matter that is ongoing, and I suppose all indications would be that we are, uh, you know, in, in, in a period of, of industrial unrest uh, generally. So, the la last year, if I was to look at the similar report, there were really only two risks identified, and that seemed like a lot. Um, we are operating in very um, challenging and uncertain times, um, and, and that's reflected in this governance statement. So this, uh, this particular statement was considered in detail at the audit panel meeting uh, last Thursday. And uh, our recommendation is that this draft statement is approved by Council for submission, um, uh, signing by the Chair of the Policy and Resources Committee then, and submission uh, as part of our draft accounts by the end of, of June. There is opportunity to revisit it and update it and reflect anything further before actually finalising the accounts in September. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Celine. That was very, very detailed and comprehensive. Uh, going now there's no one in the chamber. I'm going now to uh, WebEx, and the chair of the audit committee is Councillor Seamus Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to uh, propose the recommendation. Okay, and also via WebEx is Councillor Paul Robinson. I second that. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing anyone in the chamber. I think we're all agreed. Okay. Thank you. On to uh, item 6.6, .6, and that's to consider the report on procurement and tenders update, paper G. And again, it's over to Celine. Apologies, Chair, for, for all of the, the reports uh, here, but they're all equally important. This is the monthly procurement report. It's divided into two sections, the first section being uh, items that require your approval. And uh, there are two contracts here which are reported for approval because the uh, the actual costs exceed the pretender estimate by uh, by a margin. Uh, so those uh, our, our procedure is that those are reported for approval to to council. Uh, those are detailed up to two point one. There are three tenders to be issued, uh, as outlined at two point two, and then there are a number of tenders that we are proposing to extend for various periods of time as detailed at item 2.3. Uh, 
Uh, section 3 then provides the information on tenders that have been awarded within delegated authority um, and, uh, you know, again, where the price has been within uh, an acceptable margin uh, relative to the pre-tender estimate. Um, I also must draw your attention then at 3.2.1 that, uh, that we are looking at uh, an increase in our electricity tar tariffs in the region of uh, two and a half to three, well, over 250% almost uh, is, is what um, we are facing, but uh, that's going to be updated on a monthly basis um, and has a very significant financial impact again for the council, potentially in the region of between 500 and 700,000, uh, depending on electricity usage. And again, that may be affected by more facilities and buildings open and operating at full capacity now. So um, it is it is a worrying issue, um, but I did feel that it was important to draw members' attention to, to that position at this point in time. And currently there are no electricity companies who are prepared to enter into fixed term agreements around this. And, and I suppose given where the market's at, we don't really want to either. But uh, that is, is just, um, I suppose, to, to advise you on that. Uh, a long list of recommendations at section 9.1 for approval and then at 9.2 for, for noting the information. Okay, thank you very much, Celine. Okay, you, you've, you've all read the uh, recommendations. Um, 9.1 uh, are for approval and uh, 9.2 for noting. I'm going to go to WebEx now and we have Councillor Dono Lukafi. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, um, I'm 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 uh, content to uh, approve, but I, I wanted to um, to ask two questions really because I had raised this previously. Um, I I'm personally I don't know what other councillors like, but I'm not too interested in who actually is the tenders in these documents. I'm much more interested in the uh, the pre tender estimate against the uh, the uh, the the actual quote to come in and on the 2.1.2 the pretender estimate for grass cutting which is always an issue I think of uh, some concern because I think we should have this done in-house uh, the pretender uh, estimate was uh, 80,000 pound but I'm just wondering uh, there was no quote there because usually there is a figure for what it came in at so I was just wondering about that the second one is just a point of, uh, to, to clarify the under the 3.1.2 collection processing and recycling of street cleansing the collection aspect of that that doesn't displace any activity currently conducted by uh, our our own workers. I, I I take I just wanted to clarify that. So that's the two questions I have. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and you're happy to propose the recommendations in their entirety? Yes. Uh, there's pen, pending the answer to the first one. Thank you, Chair. All right. Okay. Celine. Yes, Chair. Um, I'm not sure why that information specifically isn't included, but my understanding is the figure is in the region of 100,000 as opposed to the 80,000 pretender estimate, which is um, a 25% um, uplift. And you know, uh, related to inquiries around that um, is that it, it's really the fuel issue. Um, all of those activities do involve fuel. Um, this augments the, the Council's um, provision in this area and on the basis of our current operations uh, it is needed uh, we don't have the capacity and the the arrangements to, to in place to do that but i understand that there is um the, it is an area that's under review and i think there will be further reports or discussion with members on the the issue of grass cutting generally um in connection with the second issue which was um no, it was more. Yes, sorry, the collection on 3.1.2. That would be collection from our our um, transfer stations depots. So it's not actually collecting it, but it's it's more the, the whole transportation of it. So no, the answer, it doesn't displace anything in terms of, of current working arrangements. Thank you, Celine. Happy enough, Councillor Coffey. Uh, Chair, I'm happy with the second reply. I uh, have to say the first reply, I'm, I'm definitely not happy with, Chair. Uh, I, I do think we as a council from memory cut a phenomenal amount of grass that we do not have any responsibility for, that uh, is uh, nothing really, it's not part of our statutory duty. The fact that we have to outsource this at a cost of 100,000, it's usually 100,000, 
I thought getting it down to 80,000 uh, was uh, uh, an advance. I wonder whether we're paying 100,000 for less grass now being cut than we were uh, when we had 100,000 the last time I saw this come up. And um, I, I just think that we as a council should not be outsourcing this work. We need to review what grass we're cutting because I, I don't think it's very good for the environment anyway. And uh, uh, why are we cutting grass that belongs to other people? I, I think we need to see a report on what grass we're cutting, and I'm not content really to support that. All the other bits have no problem with, but Chair, I, I cannot support that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm going to bring a Chief Executive on for clarification. Well, Chair, it's just specifically on Councillor O'Coffey's comments regarding grass cutting more generally, and he's quite correct, a significant amount of the Council's resource is spent on cutting grass belonging to other public sector bodies. We are collating all of that information, and the intention is that we will have a workshop with you probably in the next couple of weeks with a view to a substantive report then being brought to a future Environmental Services Committee. I do think that members then will have some uh, probably difficult decisions to take because while it is welcome that the Department for Infrastructure are now coming forward with a proposed contribution, it will fall very, very far short from the actual cost of the service. Uh, so that's just to, to clarify in that relation, uh, or the, the wider grass cutting piece. And I suppose the other element here around the um, uh, approaches and the biodiversity that is also something that we'll be reflecting on because clearly there has been a very significant change in pra practice and also public expectation now around grass cutting levels as well. Thank you, uh, Chief Executive, for your clarification. And I think Councillor McIntyre wants to come in on this issue before you, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. And it'll relieve you probably of an, any other business item, you know, because it's related. You know, the, the matter I was going to raise with you in any urgent and relevant business. So I don't have to do it in that format now. I can do it now. Um, here's, a, here's a message I got this evening from uh, a person living in Oma. Just to query, who is responsible for cutting the grass verges along the roadsides in and around the town? At this moment, they are totally unsightly, never mind unsafe, as they are restricting both motorists and pedestrians who try to traverse either onto the road or across the road. Example, the Gorton Road area, BD Park, Gort Well areas, but it's throughout the whole town and district. You know, I think we all agree that. And uh, do you want me to send photographs? Sent me a series of photographs where it's extremely dangerous, exiting junctions uh, variously. And now we'll all, we'll all have local examples in mind. So suppose uh, I was of a mind in a, any other business, to ask the council to write to DFA roads, uh, to ask them to do their duty in respect of uh, making junctions safer and grass verges safer that are under their control or remit. Um, so I wanted to make that proposal, Chair, and, and I thought this was a good relevant point to make it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McAdoff. There'll be a seconder for that proposal from Councillor McAdoff. Chamber. Uh, Councillor Irving. Second by Councillor Irving. I tell you, there'll be no disagreement there. I mean, uh, what, what, what you're saying, I think we're all contacted by that uh, on a daily Fair. basis. Uh, hold on, Councillor Green. We have a, another Councillor in the Chamber. And uh, I'll bring in Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I think that's a, a sensible enough proposal in terms of the uh, sidelines being impacted. That That is a serious concern. I, I'm not sure whose remit it falls under because there's seemingly areas that are cut and recut whenever they're not necessarily needed to be cut and there's other areas let uh, grow uh, when it is causing a bit of an obstruction and obviously safety of both uh, pedestrians and motorists is something that we have to be very mindful of. Um, I, d I do think it shouldn't be a blanket thing, though, where there are areas that it is suitable to let the grass grow. That's something that we should be doing, um, and that is something that the council has uh, committed to. I think as well, uh, again, like this, as Councillor Coffey says, this is something that comes up annually, this massive fee for, for grass cutting. And, and I'm glad to see that it is now being addressed and there is going to be a report coming back because that's something that, that is of huge concern. Uh, not least given the times that we're living in. And, and, and I'm glad as well just that the director noted 
in a 3.2.1 I think I when I was coming and I was going to say it's a, a 300% raise if you're looking at the the low the minimal and the the maximum values being charged there again it, it triggers the question what what is the purpose or what is the role of the utility regulator here because it's electric Ireland aren't really the only party that are guilty of this fossil fuel companies around the world are making massive massive profits and yet that's not been reflected uh, when it comes to the bills <coughs> excuse me chair when when it comes to the bills and the billing for consumers whether it's a, a business or whether it's an individual I, and I, like this can't go on it's not sustainable we we heard in terms of the the grass cutting issue that the the fees are rising because of the cost of fuel this is the cost of uh, energy and power going up it's completely unsustainable like I, I'm not sure what we can do as a, as a local council, but I think we do need to be asking questions of those in uh, a position of power. So again, I would maybe propose, and, and I think we've had an answer previously, whether whether there's been any advance or any change in that. I think there has been some murmurings coming from the utility regulator's office in recent times that the, that they are possibly, uh, there is a, a potential of greater powers uh, being bestowed on them. But I think that's something that we need to raise as a, as a huge matter of concern like that. An increase from 10p to 30p per half hour, is, as, as the director rightly points out, is going to be a massive dent in our finances. Um, and that's something that's been reflected across the board. So I would just make that as a wee additional proposal, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. And Councillor Green, the last speaker, by a WebEx. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, it's just in relation to what uh, Councillor McElduff uh, raised there. Uh, I, I would have great concern about uh, sight lines on functions. But uh, what I, I would like to raise, and maybe it could be added into the, the letter or, or a new letter sent uh, to uh, DFI Road Service, is the standard of service that they're hiring in to cut the grass. Uh, uh, my own local area was done uh, uh, today, I'm done. and I have uh, uh, cut, and I have uh, had uh, numerous complaints all day about it. It's actually absolutely scandalous, and this is a service that road service are uh, paying, uh, yes. uh, are outsourcing, uh, and uh, no, no business, no farmer would ever pay anybody. For the on standard of work, it's absolutely shocking. There's lumps of dirt pulled that trailed out onto the road. The parts of the ditches beat away. There's other parts of the longlands that isn't even touched. Shocking stuff. And I, I, I would like to have it. Possibly it takes away from Barry's, but I, I would like then to propose that there's a letter also sent to road service in Permana, Oma area, or the western area, asking just how the uh, uh, police. Uh, these people that come out and uh, that they're hiring to come in to do this job because it's not been done. If the arms what's been paid for and nobody's holding, uh, holding anyone to account, it's an absolute scandal. So I would propose that as well, uh, if uh, the council would uh, uh, would uh, uh, support me on it. Councillor Green, just to make you aware, I've already uh, spoke to Councillor McAduff on his proposal. He's prepared to add yours, and it? So, thanks very much. That's last great. Piece, thanks, Barry. That's seconded by Councillor Robert Irving, and that's generally agreed. Uh, there was one other proposal there by Councillor McAleer to, as an add-on. Uh, we haven't got a seconder for that, but I'm sure we can get one. Councillor McAduff, for we'll just bring you in here. Great, right, Chair. I was just going to mention. Uh, I'm not sure if Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly is in the queue there to speak. No. 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 Um, she had spoken to me yesterday about similar concerns that I've raised about the BD Park Gortwell area, and she mentioned specifically Rosemary Road and Botira as uh, local residents who, who want that attention as well, you know, to the grass and to weeds and that they're overgrown and dangerous. So if that could be included, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, you prepared a second question, McAleer's proposal. Okay, and I'll, I'll take it that's agreed as well. Right, well, uh, if you can lower your hand, Councillor Green. 
Thank you. We have still got Councillor Catherine Kelly on WebEx, and this is a, definitely the last speaker in this one. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for letting me in, Chair. Um, I, I have been notified also, so I'm wondering if Barry would be would consider adding to his letter. No, uh, uh, sorry. Arthur Hogan Park, sorry. Hogan Park, and Kerry Moore. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry Councillor Kelly, we can't add any more at this stage. Uh, I think it's, you know, if we look at it all across the district, it's the same issues, and uh, we're not going to start uh, sort of segmenting the area up. So, if you don't mind. Uh, We'll go no further with this one at this stage. Your comments are noted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, take, that has all been agreed, uh, except we, we do have to go back because uh, Councillor O'Coffey uh, has withdrawn his proposal. So this is for the recommendation as a whole. Uh, can we have a proposer and second for the recommendation as a whole, Councillor Elliott? Seconded by Councillor Robert Irvine. And those other comments have been noted. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> on to item 6.7, and it's to consider the report on staff matters and it's paper H. And we're giving Selena rest this time. We're over to Thelma Brown. Thelma. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair. So, Chair, there are two items in this paper. Uh, the first is for decision making, and the second is for information. So, I'll take you through the two items, and then happy to take any questions, Chair, if you have any for me. Um, the first item is the people plan. This is our new um, people plan for 2022 to 2027, and this updates our previous HR strategy. So, it's our five-year plan for the development of our employees within the organisation and the changing context of our organisation, and aims to help embed our council corporate values um, and align the, the plan for our people to our corporate plan. So, there are five themes within the people plan. Those are leadership development, talent management and succession planning, employee engagement, continuous learning and development, and technology and new ways of working. So the plan has been developed following extensive consultation and engagement with our trade union representatives and our employees. So at this point, Chair, we are offering you the, the plan as a recommendation for approval and adoption with the view that we will bring you annual um, updates on an annual basis through to this committee and obviously uh, more frequent updates internally through our senior management team reporting arrangements. Um, and then a mid-year review of the plan would take place in 2024 to, to uh, recheck and sort of review along with our review of the corporate plan at that stage. So, Chair, that's a, an item for recommendation for decision making. And the second item in the report is for information, just to give you an update really of where we are in relation to the 2022-23 pay negotiations. Um, which are just really due to commence and uh, as, as not to be confused with uh, any discussions or issues arising from last year's pay negotiations. And I know you will have had previous updates um, in terms of the industrial dispute in relation to that. So that's an update for information, Chair, um, in relation to the 2022-23 pay negotiations. So, Chair, as I say, the recommendations that you have from this report are we're seeking approval for the People Plan 2022 to 2027 and noting the update on the 2022 stroke 23 pay negotiations. So, Chair, if any questions? I'm happy thank you. To thank you very much, Selma, for, for your report. And we're looking at a proposal in a seconder for the two parts of the recommendation. Councillor Robert Irvine in the Chamber, seconded by Councillor Keith Elliott in the Chamber. Uh, okay, we've still got BioWebEx, we've still got Councillor Catherine Kelly with her hand up. Councillor Kelly? Removed, okay, thank you. No other, no other speakers, okay. And I take it for Councillor McAleer's even putting his hand up now. So. That's all right, Chairman, I appreciate you letting me in there. It's just uh, in relation to item three, and I've just been mindful of what's been said so far, and it's been discussed about the, the current pay negotiations and, and the proposals put down for next year. But the fact that, our, I suppose, our frontline workers who are earning really have very minimal and very 
insubstantial amounts uh, that have been forced to take industrial action. And yet those again at the, the opposite end of the pay scale and, and that's no disrespect intended to, to anybody uh, in here or working across the council. Um, the fact that there, there's a similar pay increase being proposed for those further up the chain, I think it is. it would be remiss of me not to mention that whenever it's brought before us. I think there are people who are, and families indeed, who are suffering serious repercussions because of the the pay they're taking home, but the rising cost of living, and, and we're not going to go over that whole debate again tonight, but I do think there has to be some sort of a some sort of an acknowledgement on those who are frontline workers across the board who have been forced to take industrial action this current year, that the, that the work and the effort that they do put in to keep our district running. Um, and again, as I say, no disrespect intended to anybody else, but that has to be kind of taken individually, I would have thought from that, but I appreciate that there there are points made there that the, the different trade unions and that are involved in, but I do think it's, it's something that I have to note at this point. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, Simon, do you have anything to add? You okay? I think, uh, no, I Nothing think to add at this stage. Okay, Councillor McAduff. Just, uh, I think Thelma's uh, outlining of the people plan, you know, deserves comment. You know, it's a substantive piece of work and, uh, you know, it's massive in terms of the future. Uh, so, if you even look at themes one, two, and four, you know, about building up the capacity of leaders, and, you know, could Thelma say a little bit more about that? You know, about various programs that are being undertaken in the spirit of leadership development, talent management, and continuous learning and development, maybe a special emphasis on leadership development. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McGillough, thank you. Uh, Thelma? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I suppose just to remind you, we are in the process at this point of rolling out a full leadership development pr programme uh, for leaders at all level with, levels within the organisation. So I suppose in the document there on page 10 and 11, um, you have a wee bit more information and detail on that. Um, this is aligned to our implementation of the revised organisational structure, and it was something that we committed to at the time when we were uh, review in the organization structure that we would support this um, structural review with an, the implementation of a leadership development program so that program is underway it consists of a modular program called leaders code and that's been rolled out to leaders at all levels within the organization and that is supplemented with uh, various other leadership development activities um, including uh, things like our leadership corner um, which is a reading corner uh, for leaders a leadership cafe event and a range of other um, uh, courses and programmes aimed at developing leaders, as I say, throughout the whole organisation. The second theme on talent management and succession planning, this really aims about uh, uh, implementing measures and steps to actually ensure that we are growing our own talent and harnessing the people that we have within the organisation, ensuring they have opportunities to develop and ensure they have a long-term career with the council. Um, so that is a range of measures and we're working through regional programmes there as well um, with the local government staff commission leading on a piece and I think we'll have some information for you actually at next month's uh, committee meeting just to share with you in relation to some of the regional work that's going on. And then I think the final theme you asked me was around continuous learning and development. And again, that's about the rollout of our corporate learning and development program that, you know, we not only train our employees to do the job that they're currently in, but we encourage ongoing learning and development to enhance their ability in their current role and obviously um, enhance their ability, hopefully, in future roles within the council. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. And thank you, Thelma. Okay. And can we have uh, proposed and seconded proposed by Councillor Robert Irvine and seconded by Councillor Keith Elliott, and we're all agreed. On now to item six point eight. And thank you, Thelma, for your time. And it's uh, to consider a report of the Director of Corporate Services and Governance, and it's paper A, and it's over to Celine. 
Thank you, Chair. Just at the outset, if I could add my thanks to Thelma, this is a substantial piece of work, but also to Catherine and the team for, for the work earlier. She had hoped to be with us this evening, but unfortunately um, wasn't able to, to be here to present those papers. And even if we go right back to the start, to um, to Louise and, and her team who have been working through the consultations, policy matters, uh, and uh, what you see there. And, you know, there there is uh, there's, there's a lot of heavy lifting going on at the moment, so please bear with us if there are some things that you know we have to reprioritize in that uh, to get some of our statutory work done and uh, as well as these developmental issues and that as well so thank you um for for all of their support and work and i just want to say that generally i have uh, two two items in this report and i have a third uh, verbal item just to uh, to mention to you the first one is for decision making and it is um a proposal that we've received from drum quinn healthy living partnership um, members may recall they participated in a village renewal scheme project which created a community gym. That gym sits alongside council property where there are pitches and uh, uh, there, there is a proposal to provide a walkway around the pitch. Um, this is something I think that the council would be interested to, in, in doing in, in, in the long term, but this proposal would expedite it. Um, it's, it's a little bit novel uh, in that uh, it is really seeking an offset of an existing liability in lieu of uh, the cost of, of getting uh, this done. And uh, we have tested it, first of all, through our capital, our internal capital programme board, um, who are in agreement that uh, it, it, you know, it, is, it is a good and valid project that would be something that would be taken forward um, at, at some point. And also we have done an internal independent, uh, cost assessment and we are content that the proposal does offer uh, good value for money um, aside from even what the, the challenges of um, of current procurement and that. So uh, as I say, it's, it's, it's not normally the way in which capital works are progressed or delivered by the council, but it does demonstrate um, an empowered community uh, effort, which is something that we, we would want to support and encourage. And the uh, recommendation is that we would take this forward uh, by way of a legal agreement. Uh, that, would, that would cover all of the, the relevant issues, including um, future upkeep and, and maintenance, et cetera, as well. Uh, the second item on this report is around the Full Fibre NI project, and it's really informational just to, to tell you our IT team have been providing support to this project, which uh, um, is, it aims to connect key public buildings and businesses, and we're benefiting to the tune of 76 locations across the district. Uh, that will be connected with this high-speed um, full fibre network. It is anticipated then that 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 network will be available for other businesses and local areas to uh, to, to access. But it does also mean then that we need to refresh and update our our own Wi-Fi provision, including the connections between the Grange, the Town Hall. Uh, and then the further um, public Wi-Fi facilities. And I know this is something that we'd previously discussed and, and hadn't really reached a satisfactory conclusion, but we're, we're pleased that this full fibre network project will uh, now offer much improved public Wi-Fi facilities in, in many of our, our buildings. Uh, and also then it's, it's applicable to some aspects of CCTV as, TV as well. If you're interested in the project, there's a link there to um, a, a promotional video, uh, which is available on YouTube. It's been prepared by the UK Digi Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and it focuses on the Marble Arch Caves and how it has um, benefited from this project. So it, it's a collaborative project being operated um, through a number of councils and the procurement has been led by our MAP and Bridge Creek Avon District Council. So we'll then use that framework for future uh, Wi-Fi costs and, and, and provision. Uh, so that is, is information on, on that important project. Uh, the, the final item, which is not detailed on this report, is just to make members aware that the information in relation to Council's allowances under the scheme of allowances, um, which has now been collated as part of the year-end accounts process for 21-22, um, that is, there's again a requirement that that is, is made publicly available. So um, it provides information on all allowances paid to councillors during the 21-22 year. I will um, circulate it to members, but just to advise you that it will be published on the council website before the end of the month. So that is again for information. Okay, thank you very much, Sully.
So recommendations there is at 9.1 to approve the development of a legal agreement with Drumquin Healthy Living Partnership to facilitate a capital project to provide a pathway around the council's property at 19 Omer Road, Drumquin, in, and in lieu of payment, waiving the final sum due under an existing arrangement in respect of match funding for a village renewal project completed in 2020. And secondly, then, to note the update on the full fibre um, project and associated enhancements to council Wi-Fi facilities, and also then to note the publication of the 2021 scheme of allowances uh, made during the year. Thank you very much, Celine. Okay, uh, we have no speakers in the chamber. We're going out to uh, Councillor Mary Gardy via WebEx. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks, Celine, um, and thanks for all your reports tonight, Celine, and indeed thanks to your team that you alluded to. Certainly very comprehensive stuff tonight to date, but on this item, Chair, um, I want to congratulate the team as well. I think it's forward thinking and I am content with the report and indeed the recommendations um, for the legal agreements at Umquin and to note um, 9.2 and also the verbal update um, from Celine there regarding councillor's allowances or, 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 as well. So I'm happy to propose the report. Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Gardy. And again, via WebEx with Councillor Herd Thornton. Yes, Chair, I'm very happy to second uh, Councillor Gardy in the, the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Thornton. Uh, there are no other speakers. Uh, we all agreed? Okay, see a no dissent. Thank you. We are now on, thanks for, for that, Celine. We are now on to correspondence. And first, Pete, and it's over to our Chief Executive, Alison McCullough. 7.1. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Chair, this letter is a response from the Minister uh, of Justice in relation to the Council's previous representations regarding uh, our request that the current legislation is amended so to ensure that PSNI costs associated with escorting explosives uh, would be met by uh, the relevant companies as opposed to the public purse. So the Minister has referenced the PSNI strategic review, has again reiterated the operational responsibility but I suppose it's interesting that the final paragraph also advises that this is a reserved matter uh, under the Northern Ireland Act and therefore any legislative changes would be a matter for the Secretary of State um, uh, and that to the best of my recollection Chair is not someone to whom we've made representations on this subject. Okay thank you Alison for that and I'll advise all that this uh, letter is for noting first of all can we have a post and second for noting? Councillor Robert Irvine, seconded by Councillor Keith Elliott for noting. I'm assuming we're all agreed there. Uh, we have three councillors wishing to speak on the matter. Uh, first of all, is Councillor Emmett McAleer by the, in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and thanks to the Chief Executive for, for clarifying a couple of matters there. Yeah, um, I, again, happy enough to note it, but I, I do I would like to make a further proposal um, that we do actually go back in the first instance to uh, Naomi Long. Just thanking her initially for the letter, which I think does add a wee bit of information that, that we hadn't previously been made aware of um, in relation to the role of the Secretary of State. But I, I would have a query over what has been done to date, and I would like the, the letter to address that. And just to, to ask the question uh, of, of the Justice Minister, has she established who made the decision to change the established practice of billing the gold mining companies, which was the practice up until very recently? And also what consultation took place and how were the huge financial implications for the budget costed and approved? So any uh, additional clarification or information on that would be much appreciated. And secondly, as the, the Chief Executive quite rightly points out, we haven't as yet made representation to the Secretary of State now I'm aware, as, as Minister Long notes in her letter, that we're still waiting for this uh, review. I think it was originally to be with us in April time, and uh, we're still waiting on it. But that we do contact the the Secretary of State, and again, put it, put it to him that this is something that those corporate organisations who are intent on in coming in here ripping up our resources and polluting our lands, that they should be forced to pay for this and not the public purse. People are already under enough financial hardship to be paying for the, this, the security and transport of explosives 
for multinationals who are here to make a profit and clear off. So I would like to add that as a as a second proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. For the WebEx now, and we have first of all Councillor John McLaughery. Yeah, I'd like to second the uh, noting of the correspondence. It's already been um, done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, also, um, I, I would be keen to, before we do anything in, in writing to anybody else again, that, that we write back to Chief Superintendent Sam Donaldson asking him for a timeline for the, the uh, review. Uh, as Councillor McAleer has pointed out, I understood that was coming in April and we've been quietly sitting waiting for it. So we're, we're now two months later and I suppose by the time we get a reply, that'll be three months. It'd be interesting to see if we could have a timeline as to when, when they, we would expect to see that. If we had that review, it would be easier to write then to the relevant people then expressing what, what we do. I, I think the retrospective stuff is, is go gone uh, and we've already been told by the PSNI changed their mind. They said they were given legal advice to do that. Uh, we can't really challenge that unless we, we actually see that legal advice and, and that's something I don't think we're ever going to see. So I, I'd be more keen to find out when this review is going to be made available to us that we can then use that then to, to follow up uh, where the money is going to come from to pay for these escorts. So that's my proposal. Thank you, Councillor McClory. And in the Chamber is Councillor Robert Irving. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Happy to second Councillor McClory's proposal. Okay. And back to WebEx. Can you lower your hand, please, Councillor McClory? And Councillor Donald O'Coffey by WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy to second the note of this and to second Councillor McAleer's proposals. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of questions, actually a very short letter, but there seems to be a lot of um, it, how contradictory can it be? Like the supervision of civil explosives is an operational matter for the police. And at the same time, then uh, it says that the uh, the security of explosives is a reserve matter, uh, you know, for the Secretary of State. So I, I, I think that there's a little bit of um, it certainly maybe uh, my, my interpretation of those words perhaps uh, lacks something. But uh, to anyone reading that ordinarily, I think you would read that and come to the conclusion that the two statements are quite contradictory. I would like certainly to see more clarity on that, so I'm happy to second those proposals. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Coffey. Just with regard to 7.1 that's been proposed for noting by Councillor Robert Irvine, seconded by Councillor Keith Elliott, and that was generally agreed. Uh, there were other proposals then put by Councillor Emmett McAleer that we write back to uh, Naomi Long, the Justice Minister, and also to the Secretary of State, two separate proposals there. And they have been both seconded by Councillor Donald O'Coffey. And then we've had another proposal there from Councillor John McClary, seconded by Councillor Robert Irvine, that we again write to uh, Sam Donaldson of the Police Service in Northern Ireland uh, to clarify the timeline situation. Are we all agreed with those uh, proposals? Okay, I'm not seeing any dissent in the Chamber or via WebEx. So that's all agreed. Thank you. Hey, Alison, and we're on now to uh, 7.2. Yes, Chair, thank you. This is just the details of the uh, National Association of Councillors UK conference to take place at the end of this month. Um, in terms from the 24th to the 26th of June, the delegate fee, Chair, is £350 plus VAT. And then the accommodation cost is £135 per night and travel costs would be additional to that. OK, thank you, Alison. Uh, and initially, this is for noting, can we a proposal and seconder and a note? Mr. Robert Irving? Proposed noting, Chair. Proposed the note and seconded in the Chamber by Councillor Keith Elliott for noting. Um, going to WebEx now, uh, no, Councillor Gardy's taken down her hand, that's fine. Um, we're all agreed that's that's noted. Uh, and seven point three. There's no other correspondence. Now we're on to item eight, and there's any urgent and relevant business. And Councillor Michael Duff had a piece, but he's already raised the issue, so that's dealt with. Any other urgent, relevant business, Celine, for from your point of view? 
Nope. Okay, we, ne we now need a proposal from seconder to go on to uh, committee, as proposed by Councillor Tommy Maguire.
Tommy McGuire and agreed. Okay, Lord. Okay, we're we have, we're now out of committee, and can I ask uh, Celine uh, to give a resume of what actually took place in confidential business? Thank you, Chair. In confidential business, um, the minutes of the confidential minutes of the meeting of the eleventh of May uh, were reviewed, and uh, there was a, a verbal update on one of the issues there, and uh, the confidential staffing uh, report was presented and agreed. Okay, thank you for that, Celine. Can we have a proposer and seconder? Commissioner Robert Irving, Commissioner Keith Elliott. And we're all agreed. Okay, at this juncture, I would like to thank our Chief Executive, our Director, uh, and also Thelma and Lauren, who is doing her WebEx this evening, and the councillors who attended the Chamber and via WebEx. And thank you for again for your cooperation. And it is now, according to my watch, it is uh, 9.50 p.m. So thanks again.